This week's episode is sponsored by White's Beaconsfield. White's Beaconsfield is the number one company in the UK to brighten up your smile at a very affordable price. Get your perfect smile today using code AGJAMESENGLISH at checkout for a 15% discount on all products. from White's Beckinsfield. I'm on day five out of seven and my teeth are looking white. So it doesn't contain peroxide, so it's very, very safe for you to use on your teeth. It doesn't cause any sensitivity and I've literally got the most sensitive teeth. The most affordable product, works like a dream. Look how white, with no filter, no sensitivity, and it is just one of the best that I've ever used. Like, that's three days, it's crazy. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. We was able to control the prices of drugs in the community. And every time we come out to parties, cars are pulling up and shooting at us. And we're just, just about getting away. I bought Uzi basically. I think I paid around five grand for it. Were you going to kill people? Yeah, at that stage, I did. You see, as soon as I told him to turn his bile off, he stepped out of his car, and as soon as he put his foot on the pavement, all I heard was, pop, 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 pop. He said, we're fucked, look, there's police down there, there's police behind us, police at the side of us. And no one was talking, so I just pulled it out the window. I didn't look. I just pulled it out the window, and I just went, duh, 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 duh. So as that wheel was going, I jumped out the car. When I jumped out of the car, there was like, you know them police with the, the hats on and that, and they had the MP5s, they said, don't move, don't move. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've yeah. got London's Quincy Fwaits. That's right. Yes, <laughs> brother, yes. <laughs> How you been? I've been all right, you know, just um, focusing on my work. Had a few problems last week. My grandson um, stopped breathing, so. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, but he's all right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's just life, innit? Mm-hmm. Ups and downs. Yeah. You know I mean, good come with the good, come with the bad, so. Yeah. yeah. Just got to push on, and that's sad, yeah, though, man, so. It's the only way we can help, really, by yeah. pushing on. If you yeah. stay stagnant, it doesn't help anyone. Mm-hmm. First you know. of all, brother, thanks for coming on. No problem. You've been in prison since you were 15. Yeah, 15 basically. to 21. Yeah. You got out for a few months. Yeah. Shot a news at the coppers. Mm. Done a 15. Now you're out, free man, doing yeah. good things. Yeah. How does it feel to be a free man now? A free man now is definitely a free man. It's definitely different from a free man from before. Because last time when I was um, coming out of prison, I had no, no, no thoughts in my mind of ever changing. Because all the, all the things I was doing, it's kind of like when I was young, some people's, some people's child was different, but I was actually trained to do what I done when I was young. When I mean trained, I'm on about, I was raised um, um, by like one of the most feared gangsters in South London. Yeah, everyone knows who he is. Who is that? Yeah. His name's Vincent. Yeah, and obviously, um, that's my stepdad. And I, I love him dearly, innit? Like, it's not a thing of, oh yeah, um, you know, I've changed. He's he's an older person now as well, and he see things different in it. So my life under his teaching made me who I am. I can't I can't hate it. Yeah, I can be mad with my upbringing because obviously I wasn't 
I didn't get the upbringing of a normal child, but in the world that we live in, I don't think about his teachings, I'd be here even talking to you now. Like I could have become a, another statistic or a victim of the streets or the community that we live in yeah. without, his, without his guidance and his tutelage, even though he didn't have to actually tell me what to do. It's just that I lived in it. So, yeah. so and he's got one of the big, he's, he's, he's got one of the biggest families mm -hmm. about, so. I always go back to the start with my guest as well, Quincy, yeah. where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. So I, 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 I grew up in a place called Kennetton. It's not far from here. It's just probably two roads away. Um, that's if you want anybody to know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite out. Yeah, it's a place called Kennetton. And um, I was there with my mum. Um, there was a fire. That's what I do remember. And um, we moved. Um, I think we stayed at um, our aunt's for a while. But my aunt's, they came all the way down from Manchester because my mum was in a foster home. So when my aunt came down to England, I mean to London, she brought the sisters with me, which is my mum. Mum's a twin sister. And like I said, we started in Kennington and then we moved to Clapham. And then when we moved to Clapham, we didn't really have much, but we was happy. You know what I mean? I could, that was the last probably feeling of, you know, as a kid of happiness that our papa had. Because, um, my mum then met, now basically my dad, my dad um, suffered from mental health and he was, um, he had a few situations with my mum and then obviously me and my mum was hiding from him at the time. And obviously he's in, right now he's in um, prison because um, he, he killed someone basically um, a few years ago. Like he was in a mental institution and then he came out into the care and I was going to see him. And then one day I came back and they just said, oh, he killed one of the other workers in the, not workers, you know, one of the other patients in the, in the house that was living. There's like, like a little hostel. So that was only the really relationship I have with my dad, my real dad. And then obviously he's in Leicestershire prison now. And I go to see him every now and then, obviously because of the COVID, I'm not able to see him. But then my stepdad came onto the scene. And um, the one thing I, the first thing I remember is gates coming up on our house. You know, like metal door, gates on all windows, fence around the flat. And that was the kind of first sign of, you know, control. Because I didn't know nothing about that before. But obviously, as I grew older, I realised that's how we had to live. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if that's how we had to live, that's how we had to live. Because obviously he's met my mum. And what usually happens in them kind of relationships, the man takes control. Do you know what I mean? So from there, that's when my life changed. I didn't notice at first, but it was like, that is when I started to see the street. I didn't really see it before because I was my mum's son and we had a sister, but obviously my mum's first and obviously they protect you from things at a certain time. But then when he came in, uh, I remember every night, what I used to have to do was, I used to get all the latest movies and I used to film them like around 20 times. Cause he's got like probably easily over 38 daughters and sons. What? Easily, yeah, easily, easy. Probably he's even got more now, probably over 40. 40 That's kids? That's the last time I checked, yeah, him, all his, all his, you know what I mean, in the community. That's what I said, he's got a big family, yeah. So I've got lots of brothers and sisters, yeah? And I had to have a copy of all the late, you know, all the gangster films, you know, from the Scarfaces to the, everything you can think that's of a gangster flick of that, I had to have to film them one by one. So I'm just a little kid and I'm just watching these films over and over again, because I can't, I can't do nothing else except for do this. And obviously I end up watching them. So that's the first kind of time that I saw visuals of a gangster. And then when I'm watching the Jamaican movies and... But that's probably what made me got into music also because I used to copy Reggae Sunsplash over and over. So I used to get all the top videos and copy them for all the family. Then after a while, what happened is he had a shop in Brixton on the front line. And obviously we live in the same household, innit? Yeah, so we go to the shop every day. 
So when we go to the shop every day, you see the order in Brixton that he has. Like, you know, like the people that come to the shop to pay homage or at the time you don't know what's going on, maybe they're... Was he feared? Yeah, he was very feared. He, he was the most feared... He's the most feared person I've ever seen in my life. And I've been through prison systems and but I've never ever seen no one. Did you feed him? Yeah, 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 of course. Every, everyone did. It was just... It was the policy of being around him. He makes it happen. He makes it like that because he's so serious. You know what I mean? I've never met someone that's so serious. And he's so serious that his vibe, once he comes in the room, he can change your vibe. You know that? So if he's happy, everyone can be happy. If he's sad, everyone's going to be sad. Or if no one's talking, if he don't want to talk, there's silence in the room. That's just the energy that he brings. Do you know what I mean? And like I said, it's not just, you know, some people are just bad in their house. Like he wasn't, he was, it was everywhere he went. Like he, he was in control or control. So the first thing I've seen when it comes to violence would be through him. And obviously it was, it wasn't just a one-off, it was over and over again. Do you know what I mean? Because what his thing was, his thing is was where we're on the front line. There's 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 war against the Jamaicans and the English black boys. Yeah, obviously he's an English black boy, isn't it? And they're coming into our community with a different kind of attitude. Do you know, like before, maybe arguments could have been solved by fist fights and stuff like that. But when when they the Jamaicans came, they kind of Bring a different viciousness to the community where we was, because remember, it's, it's the front line is one road. We just got our we just got our shop based on the front line, yeah, um, and it's a food shop, so all the locals come there. But more than locals, it's the English black boys and the English black women that come there. Then obviously there is a few Jamaicans that come there, but it's not the hardcore that have just come over from Jamaica. It's probably like one that's been here for years and they integrated with the English boys. So his thing, his thing is, was he's defending his turf from them. So that's how I got raised, not to be fearful of people or in particularly Jamaicans, Yardies who kind of try to, if you could say it, like they try to colonize the community because when I say that, I'm on about through beatings, shootings, selling drugs, taking women. And obviously he was not gonna make that happen. And he had a team of people around him that was able to support him to do that. So that's what, that's, that's what I grew up in. I grew up in him defending the community from the Jamaicans. So it was a war basically? It was a war, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Were you and taking drugs or anything at the time, drinking? Who, him? You. No, no, I'm a kid. You're still young at the time. Yeah, I'm a kid. I'm probably yeah. around six, seven. So you've seen all this for a yeah, young I'm age. Yeah, all of this, From yes. your dad in prison, yeah, from yeah. one of the toughest men in London, yeah. the tough war with the Jamaicans. And, exactly. And your dad. No, my dad's not even prison yet. My yeah, dad, your stepdad. He's in mental institution. How many boys did your da stepdad have around him at, at the time? time? Yeah. What do you mean, sons? Just like friends, best friends, uncles, sons. Uh, he, had, he had a couple brothers and two friends, I could say. But it was more just, it was more about him though. I, f I believe that if he got taken out, it'd all fall down. I believe that. Obviously he's got people around him, but he's the main driving force. If, if it wasn't for him, Brixton would have been a different Brixton than what I grew up in. Do you know what I mean? Cause like I said, when they were coming over it, it was drive by shooting, stuff like that. And really, we wasn't even really used to stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? It was more things could get sorted out. When, when, it's, when he was fighting against them, it's like one action just snowballs. Do you know what I mean? Where before one action, we've all grown up with each other. People can make a phone call to someone's parent or say something and then we can come together and it's squashed. You're my son, you're my son, he's my friend, he's my, it's done. But with them, because they don't live in the community either, it was more like hit and run. So it was more like they were coming to our community. You know, like you could wake up one morning, come to the office and you hear that Mikey, 
he's got a shot down the corner, a yard man cut him in the face because he didn't serve him when he wanted to be served. You know, like, they're the kind of things you could hear in the community. But, like I said, if it wasn't for him, we could have been living in a different, I could have got raised in a different time. But he, def he defended it against them and he ran them out of the area. So, really, after that, it was just what we do with the area. But I got arrested, so, by the time I was 15, so, I didn't have the, the time or the capacity to take over, you know, from what he left off, because I went to prison at a young age. Yeah. Did you ever go to school? Yeah, I went to, I went to primary school and I went to secondary school for one year. And then from that one year, in between that one year, I ended up in children's homes. And um, from, my from when I was in children's home, I didn't, I didn't um, go back home ever. What was your stepdad saying when you were going into children's home? Was there a relationship no, there with him no, or was no. it just a free-for-all with his kids? No, basically, yeah, it was a thing of... I was at home and I was... Um, I was kind of getting involved in, you know, a little, little petty crime, yeah? I got pe petty crime and then one day I was at the police station and uh, um, I wanted to um, speak to my mum and... Uh, the policeman said to me, oh, I spoke to your, your parents and they said they don't want you to come home. So I said, what do you mean they don't want you to come home? They said, yeah, they don't want you. They said, they said you're not going to understand, but what we're going to do is we're going to get social services to come and find you somewhere to live. They don't want you there. So, obviously at the time I was angry, but the way I processed it was afterwards is basically you don't want me home because you don't want the police coming to the house. Can remember, if I'm making police come to the house, they, not, they now know where you live and you don't ever want them to know where you live. That's the reality that I live in. That's how serious life was. Because even when I used to walk home with him, if we saw anyone that he knows on the state, we'd run the other way. Because we don't even want no one to see that we're in this area. Like We lived right in the community for... When I was, when I was, when I was out, at least eight years. Because we moved house when we was with him for around eight years and nobody knew where we lived. My mum's sisters wasn't allowed to the house, my cousins wasn't allowed to my house, his brothers, his sisters, no one was allowed to the house, only we knew where we lived. So when I was getting arrested for petty crime, it was just like, yeah, he's hotting up our empire, you know, that type of stuff. So I was, I was made, to, I, just, I just got, what's that word? What's that word? Oh. You know, when you just, you just get discarded, basically. Abandoned? Yeah, abandoned, whatever you say. Like, Disowned? I was just, yeah, just, just, yeah. Our, our thing is we don't want police at the house. It's a scary environment to be in, isn't it? And yeah, yeah. that you're, you're being dodgy, but mm. you're, you would rather give away your kids to protect your the, 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 life of crime? In, 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 their, in, their, in, their, in their eyes, the bigger picture. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that's how I ended up in care. I ended up in care because I, came, I kept on doing little petty crime and get arrested and they just didn't want police to come to the house. And how old were you then? Um, probably around 12. Probably around 12. Where did you, so you were in children's homes just staying in there? Yeah. What was that like? Uh, it, it wasn't nice at first. It wasn't nice at first because when I first went to children's home, the difference between children's home and being at home, I'd prefer to be at home. So that wasn't nice because, you know, you miss your sisters. Because by that time, I've got two sisters and a brother, a little brother. So there's four of us in the house. So obviously, I miss them. Yeah. And like, I'm only 12. So, you know, being at home and missing your brother and sisters is kind of a normal thing. Yeah. But then after a while, when I'm at the children's home, I kind of started to run away from the children's home and run back to the community, Brixton. But I wasn't going home, I was meeting up with my friends. Obviously I was in a, a gang called the 28s at the time. It's a little Brixton gang. And um, I used to link up with some of them. Um, I used to stay at some of their houses when, I, when their parents would allow me. Some people would sneak me through the window, stuff like that. Sometimes I've broken into houses, you know, like empty houses and sleep for the night. Um, Norwood bus station, I've gone into the bus stations and slept on the top of the bus, you know, just for the night. 
But when I started to go through that, the rough sleeping and that, um, children's home then felt nice to me. Luxury. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So like I said, from when I was at my mum's to the children's home, I was unhappy with it. I didn't like it. But after having a bout on the street and trying to rely on friends who, where well, we are young, so it's not like they're letting, letting me down, it's just their parents. I say, no, I don't want him here, or bloody bloody. Then I realised children's home was a decent place. Yeah, you were getting that's, fed, that's roof what, over your head. Yeah, that's what, that's what I thought at the time. So you were homeless you know I mean? as well from the ages of 12? Yeah, and then what happened is where, I, where my crime started to get a bit more worse, they now remanded me into care. So your family putting you in care and you being remanded into care is two different things. So I'm going to court now. And because I'm going to children's homes and running away, they're saying now, the court is, I mean, the children's home is now responsible to get for, for getting me to court. So it's called a custody order, a remand, remand into custody order. And I had that from me from when I was around probably, just before I was 13. So if I run away from a children's home, anytime police in Brixton see me, like, you all look around, I'm arrested. So it was like, Every time I go to Brixton, it's cat and mouse with me and the police every day, every day. And probably that's why I built up my hate for them. Because I'm just a young guy trying to have fun and they're always chasing me. Do you know what I mean? Because obviously, in getting raised by Vincent, you'd naturally hate police anyway because police are always onto him. But when you're growing up, you don't know why they're onto him. You're just thinking, why are these people always bothering him? But as you get older, you understand because it's him versus them. Was he ever him. in prison himself? He went to prison for a few times, but he didn't get convicted. He didn't get, he didn't get convicted of anything. Yeah, so everything dropped. Yeah. So when you got your first prison sentence at 15, was that the YOs? Yeah, that was... Um, what was that for? Um, robbery. What did you steal? Um, basically, what happened was... What happened was, what we done is, basically, we was doing things like... Like, basically, in shops, at particularly off-licenses, you see the till? Yeah. If you put your hand underneath, there's a little flick, yeah? And we used to just, like, three or four of us, we just go in there, flip the till, and just, you know, like, storm the till, yeah? But what's happened is now, through the children's homes and stuff like that, I've met other people where I started smoking crack, yeah? You know, crack cocaine. Yeah, yeah. I'm not telling myself I need more money. You just know you need more money. Because now also, even though we're smoking crack, we were in designer clothes. So people in the community, they might think, oh yeah, them guys look like they're making money, but we're not really making money. We just kind of got a front. You know, like the designer clothes is like a front, like gold chains and stuff like that. But we're smoking lots of crack. So as that's happening, we start realizing that this little money in the tills is not gonna, it's not gonna hold us. So what happened after that was we started to go into building societies. And you remember the building societies like Abbey National and that they never had no Yeah, the glass. They never had no glass. Windows up. Yeah, so so we just we just got brave and started jumping over them. Like a couple of my friends have been hit, you know, like in the chin and stuff. But we just started jumping over and it was like every man for their self. So someone could come out of three grand, next man could come out of five grand. Next man might get lucky, come out at 15 grand, but you'd never know because everyone's cheats and everyone's lies. Just a lies. Kind of job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one declares anything. Yeah. Like, if you get something. Yeah, in case there's something they wanted more. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So it was just like that. And then we was getting arrested for that. In fact, in fact, the first time I went to robbery, I mean, I went to jail, it was for theft. But it was the theft of that, mm -hmm. of that same kind of type of move. And then... Because we kept on doing it, kept on doing it, and kept on getting bail because it was theft. I went to court one day and the judge, and not the judge, prosecutor said, no, we're going to change the law because these guys keep on getting bail, yeah? And they keep on getting, like, no more than 12 months. Yeah, so they changed the law. Because no one was actually going in there and touching anybody, they called it steaming. They got us all, they got us all together, you know, like, you know, like, they know that it's those guys from Brixton that do this, yeah? And went to wherever they went and changed the law from theft to steaming and steaming 
is covered by robbery. Yeah. So now we're getting committed to Crown Court instead of staying in the magistrates. Yeah, so that was the first time you went to prison? Yeah, so the first time in prison is when we went, we went, you know, I'm, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit, you know, like a bit more, a bit cocky now, innit? Because I've been to jail, so many, not jail, court so many times for this thing that I'm thinking is theft. But now I've gone to court one day and they said, yeah, you're getting committed to Crown Court. But obviously, as far as I know, you can't get committed to Crown Court on these charges, which is theft. And because I'm young, it's going to stay a magistrate. They said, no, nah, we change it to steaming and steaming is classed as robbery. So now everything started to get serious. Now we're talking about years in prison. So when I'm hearing years now, that's scary. Before it was just months. So yeah, that was the first time I went to prison. And, and like I said, now they've changed it to robbery. And I remember the first time I went to prison, they used to have these holding cells. And um, I can't remember where it was, you know. You didn't go straight to prison. Yeah. You went to these holding rooms. And when you're in the holding rooms, you were the adults and everybody. So I think that was the most scariest time for me to go to prison. Because remember, I'm, I'm sitting in a room with big guys. But that place got closed down. It got closed down. I don't know why it got closed down, but it got closed down. So we've gone to Feltham. I'm still high on drugs, but I ain't got no drugs. So what was it like then when you were high on drugs, but you couldn't get them? Um... What's funny is, yeah, you see, because we were smoking so much crack, it wasn't like, you know, usually um, a cat's life is, uh, like a crackhead, a normal crackhead that walks the streets life is basically buy a 20 pound stone, get high, search all day for the next high, beg money. And you know, like his high comes in bits. He's always chasing the high. When we were smoking, we were smoking like, I don't know, mate, Maybe three of us would go half on an ounce of crack. And when you're kind of smoking crack like that, it's not like how a cat would feel because I'm smoking till I'm sick and I don't want to smoke no more. So I don't know if that made me, when I got to prison, not even think about it. Because I know, obviously, a normal cat will be clucking. I've seen them banging their doors. They need medication. I never went through that. The only time, the only thing I went through is probably I had sleep and woke up with cold sweats. And I, I never ever felt like I want a drug. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was in the environment to even want the drug. Like when you're out and we're going to clubs and we're with girls and you got money and it just feels like part of that deal. When you're sitting in a cell, there's nowhere to go, there's no music. Crack's not something that what I was thinking about, but obviously my body was definitely craving it. Craving it, but it wasn't. I wasn't actually thinking about it like that. You know, I'd think more like I want a spliff or I want a, I want a cigarette or something like that. Were you training then? Like, I've been training most of my life because I was my stepdad made me do boxing, and I was quite good. Like, I got to the ABA quarterfinals, Royal Albert Hall, Boxer England, all that type of stuff, but. It wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to play football. He forced me to do that. But in a weird way, it's a good thing that he did because of the path that I ended up going down. So when I've reached to prison now, I'm confident in my hands. I was confident in my hands when I was on the street. So I was confident in my hands in prison. And I just had lots of fights with lots of people. And um, I got kind of put up from the young offenders to the adult side within a quick kind of period, maybe six months, because I was fighting, I was fighting, I was even fighting officers and gym staff and just people that was bigger than me. When I was 15, I was very small. Do you know what I mean? But see, like you mentioned before about the legs and yeah. that, I was solid in that and I had good foundation and I knew how to fight. so. Where I wasn't scared to fight, I would fight quicker than the next person. You know, like some people might want to talk about it for a while, but you know, as soon as something happened or someone said something wrong, I'd hit them straight away, you know, to gain the advantage. I'd, I'd do that all the time. And it's not because 
It's not because that's what I wanted to do, but that's what I've seen when I've grown up. You attack first. Act first, think later. Yeah, you act first. So yeah, that's so that's why most most fights that I had, I was always on top because like I said, I could fight and I always knew to move first. Yeah. Especially in prison, there's not too much shouting yeah. and arguing. It's no. got to be yeah. it's you or them. It's gotta be quick. Did you feel as if you had to live up to your stepdad's reputation? Inside prison, did he have a good reputation inside. inside prison, or did you feel as if you had to build your name yourself? No, I felt like once I got abandoned, I had to build my name myself. And because I've seen what the level is, you know, like being around him, I think it just naturally made me go harder. Not be, not that I, I made a mental note to go harder than him on, and I just things that I've seen. I wanted the same effect. Do you know what I mean? Because I saw how he had respect and fear into other fear people. For him. Yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd rather you deal with me like that than the pretend stuff. Because when I realised in the pretend stuff, that's when people get betrayed, set up, and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? So I just wanted it just to be. I don't want no one speaking to me. I don't want no one telling me nothing. I will react to everything. Anything, anyone, anything puts my way, I react to it. So I got in a lot of trouble quickly, and then I ended up on a wing called K2. I don't know if you've, you've ever heard that. Never heard of it. Yeah, it's in Feltham, and it's called the weight unit. Yeah, and obviously some guy, um, he killed himself or something, and they named the unit after him. I think he was getting bullied or something, and they named the wing after him. So I didn't actually bully anyone, but what happened was. Cause I kept fighting, and then I fight. I fighted at. I fighted at S. Well, I didn't fight at S. I just attacked him, and then after that, they kind of like moved me to the adult wing. I don't know what it's called, like starred up, whatever they did. And they moved me from the fifteen-year-old to the eighteen-year-old wings, and then I got convicted. And then once I got convicted, they moved me over to a place called Dunlin and Eagle in Feltham. It's the adults convicted side. So I went over there. I went over there, I had a fight with a guy from the surgery. Yeah, his name was Danny, Danny Mills. And he was from my area, actually. Yeah, Acre Lane. Yeah, but he was an older boy. But he was on the surgery, and I came to the surgery, and I just put my plate there. And he just put, you know, just like maybe a few chips. And I said, what's that, bro? And he just said, move on, man, move on. And he was a red band as well. You know what a red band is, isn't it? Yeah. And he worked in the gym. So he was, because he's been there for a few years. He's, he's on the pass everywhere. Yeah, he's, he's in there with the officers. Do you know what I mean? So obviously he said, yeah, go on. And they said, yeah, wait, it's going bang up. Rare, rare, rare. So anyway, I banged up anyway. And then maybe around three days later on, I must have, um, I, 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 I come down the stairs and seen him coming in. And there's a TV room under the stairs. So I just said, yeah, come, 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 come. Yeah. I remember he's looking at me like I'm a little boy. Do you know what I mean? So he's coming there quickly. Um, we've had a quick little skirmish. I've got the better of him anyway. Punched him up. He's got lots of bruises. I've gone back to my cell. And then um, after, because he's, cause he's their boy, I know how they perceived it. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, it's that four again, starting trouble, bloody, bloody. So I just heard everyone bang up. And then you hear, you know, the Mufti squad, you can hear them, you know, like coming down the landing, locking people's landing. And then I think from that time I got Muftied, I got Muftied every time they come for me. Like it was like, from there, it was just like, it was constant. So now they brought me to this bully wing, yeah, and have told me that, yeah, he's gave a statement basically. I didn't ever thought he would have gave a statement. So he's a little snatch? Uh, yeah, I'd have never thought he would have gave a statement because he, his profile, he's the big man. Do you know what I mean? And he's from the same area as me. So I just, I didn't thought he would do that. So, um, I think that's because of your reputation you were getting and because of your stepdad. What, why he G'd me up? Yeah. No, I reckon he probably G'd me up because, remember, yeah, I've assaulted the officer, the SO, and they're really out for me from then. So where he's in there with them, I think they've told him to write this because remember they, they want me on that wing yeah so that was an excuse for them to move yeah 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 and then he probably got a nice little ship out to a cosy prison yeah you know out the way push your job in no the one, jail yeah no one don't need to see his bruises on his face he can just cut out and just I think they'd probably done a deal mm -hmm. 
But you know, like when you're young, you don't know that. But you know, after understanding how prison works, yeah, it makes sense. Race, it makes sense. That's what happened. Do you know what I mean? So I went to this bully wing now, and on this wing, the um, how can I put it? Like the space between the cells is around as long as that city. I mean, as wide as that city, mm -hmm. or this, or this table, just a bit, just a bit more wide. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, yeah. So your cells are at the end of that, and my and our cells are at the end of this yeah. corridor. And outside the corridor, there's a blue box. And when that cell opens, you gotta come out yourself. Don't ever go past that blue box, and say your name and your number. As that door opens, you gotta run out quickly. Like if that officer gets to the end of that corridor, and all of you are in in the in the in that square in your gym kit and saying your name with your point sheet in your hand, you're gonna lose points. And you can get off this wing within five weeks, bear in mind, yeah? But no one ever does. Why? Because down there, they pretend like they're there to help you become better, but they're not, they're torturing you. Do you know what I mean? So you can lose points for the simplest things because bear in mind, you're not allowed to talk down there. You're not allowed to speak at no time unless you're speaking to them. Like they don't want to hear no talking out the window. If they hear you whispering at the pipe, you just hear your door knock. Point sheet under the door. You lose 500 points. And you're supposed to be gaining. I think you can, I think you can, you can't lose, you can't lose more than 2,000 in a week for you to get up to level 1.2. And then it's level two, then it's level 2.1. Then it's level 2.25 and then you're off. How many points do you need to get out? You can't lose no more than 2,000 points every week. So if you did lose 2,000 points in one week, do you stay there an extra week? You just, you just drop back down to the bottom. So if I went so to... So if you were on level three and you got 2,000 points, you're back down to you're zero You're back down again. to zero. You're back, you're back down to zero. And, that, and, that, and, that's, and, that's, and that's how it is for everybody. Like, there's no, there's no um, favouritism or nothing. Like, like you, when you're working your way up, they expect you to be advancing. So that's that's what they say. They expect. So if you get to level two, that means because you've grown. So if you do something stupid, that means you haven't grown. So we're gonna put it back. It's to your the own bottom. fault. Yeah. So we go straight back to the bottom. Did you ever get to level three and then they fucked you straight back? Never. Because what kept happening to me is, I kept on, like for the first few weeks, I tried, yeah, and then it was stupid things like you come in my come in my cell, and because this they they do spelling cell inspection in it. And you know, anything it could just be. They'll go if they don't want you to come up to the wing. They'll go and wipe something. They know you. Know, you know, like some real thing, like under the corner. Yeah, dust or something. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, look at that. Two fifty points straight away. Um, in your, in your, um, in your, you're not allowed nothing in your soul. So if you want anything, you have to apply in the morning. And you know, um, you know the medicine things, what they put the medicine in from the parcel, from yeah. the hatch. You can have that with shower gel, that with, that with soap, toothpaste. You can't have everything. You can never have your things. If you want biscuits, they'll give you free biscuits, wrap it in tissue. Like, they, if you want juice, they'll fill up the bottom of your juice like that. You know, just to the bottom mm -hmm. there, no over that line. And that's you for the day. Do you know what I mean? Um, Did you lose weight? And yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Because when also when they're feeding you, they're giving you the basic. Yeah. You know, like if you're using the wing, you could get extra chips or extra bread. There is no extras down there. It's just basic. Yeah. And if you don't like what they're giving you, just don't eat it. Cause did that there make is you more? Options. Did that make you more angry towards the authorities? The thinking, this is just torture. Yeah, def definitely. But at the time, I didn't realize I was getting more angry towards them mm -hmm. because. The life that I've been living has been kind of, I've always been kind of controlled, whether it's from my stepdad to the children's homes, to the courts, to prison, and then now to a different level of control from these people. So it wasn't just control from, I wasn't getting, I didn't need to get angry because the police are controlling me or the government's controlling me. It's because I've always been controlled, one way or the other. So I'm more, more getting angry of still being controlled, not not being controlled by police or being tried with the government. I don't think my resentment for them was building up as fast as it could 
until I got into my second sentence. Because by then, I go around to all these other prisons and I'm getting treated the same, nothing's different and it's getting worse. But as for that unit, what happened to me when I was on that unit, I'd made a conscious decision that I'm not getting off this wing. So where I'm not getting off this wing, I'm just gonna have fun. And when I mean have fun, I don't mean have fun as in have a party, but if I wanna talk to someone, I'm gonna talk to them. If I wanna have a fight with someone, I'm gonna fight them. And I just done what I wanted to do down there until it come to the day where the governor phoned the prison, I mean phoned the unit and said, yeah, just take him off the wing. He, he, ain't, he ain't gonna change. And they put me on some wing called Albatross. Albatross is like a therapeutic wing. And I was there for a month while they was assessing me to see if I was in my right frame of mind. Psychotic? Yeah, they were trying to see if I'm, because I don't, because I'm not conforming to their Rules and regulations. Yeah, policy, yeah, yeah. And, and they're looking at it like I'm disturbing, you know, what they're trying to do down there. Because remember, there's other people down there that... Are working through it, doing what they're told. Yeah, and they and then you could hear me go, yo, send me a, <laughs> yo, send me a <laughs> I mean, you ain't sending me a Rizla. Send it to me, huh? Do you know what I mean? And and they can hear that. They don't really want to talk. Yeah. But he's talking to them. He's drawing them out. So they, mm-hmm. they said, yeah, get him off. So I went to Albatross. Stayed there. They got TVs in their cells and everything. Albatross. I thought, yeah, I was, I was, I was actually happy at the time because in in that K two, you don't have music, you don't have nothing. The most you can have is a book, or if the screw is happy with you that day, you might just put the newspaper under your door. You know, if you think you've been chilling out or mm. you've been behaving. And how old were you then? Um, Sixteen. So that's like solitary confinement, basically. Yeah, yeah, at yeah, such yeah, a young yeah, age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, just after I got my sentence. So after I got sentence, I got put on that unit. So I was on Albatross, done the assessment, they realised I was okay. And then they moved me to some place called Ellsbury. Now Ellsbury, that was like for all, you know what, Ellsbury's like the dispersal of wire-wise. You know like, so it's just like Long La and Full Sutton, all in mm-hmm. one prison. So Manchester, London, Birmingham, all the kids that do serious crimes and even people that do murders. Yeah, because there was one guy in there that looked like Chucky. Yeah, you know Chucky. Yeah, ginger hair. He looked like yeah. Chucky, yeah, but he had glasses. Wasn't yeah? Scottish by any chance, nah, was he? No, he wasn't Scottish. He wasn't Scottish, yeah. And he, I swear, he's one person, yeah, that I was wary of. And the thing about him is, yeah, he didn't talk to nobody. He just came out of his cell, watched TV. And you dare not turn over the TV when the man yeah. is watching the TV yeah. because he just got this look. But the thing is, he was softly spoken, but his whole energy... Because you know he was in there for doing a madness. Mm-hmm. You knew, just leave him alone. Yeah, because he could snap. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And no matter how everyone's running around talking about their killers and their this and their shooters, like he really is. And he's not bragging or boasting about it. Mm-hmm. He's just sitting in the corner like, don't mess with me. Do you get what I'm saying? So everyone avoided him. That's one, that's one guy I do remember. Yeah, so we're in this, we're in this, we're in this like dispersal of wire wise and with everybody else is you're from London, you're from Manchester, you're from Birmingham and everyone just holds their corner. The only time it kind of overlaps is if there's beef. So I kind of learned from then about, you know, like ter- territorial kind yeah. of behaviours. Do you know what I mean? So but at the same time I've been trained by someone who's survived all of that already. So it wasn't nothing that worried me. I just got stuck in and I fighted and I fighted and I fighted and I fighted and I fighted. And then they sent me to Portland. Have you heard of Portland? Yeah. So Portland, when I went there, it was a different setup again, because I think me and one next black boy called Oki were the only black people there. And this is like, it was full of, some, it was full of a gang called the Rondon Valley Skinheads. I remember them, clearly, yeah? And like when you go in the shower with them, they got the NF tattoos, you know, the swore stickers. I remember one had a, um, a black man getting hanged, you know, under his armpit. What? Yeah, right there, just right there. And when you shower, you're seeing all of this, innit, yeah? And they're all muscly, they're all on steads and that, yeah? So it, it, the situation seems very daunting. Do you know what I mean? So I was in there, 
I was in there. This is this is coming to the end of my sentence. So it's not really somewhere you want to be towards the end of your sentence. Was it you're intimidating? Trying to get out. Yeah, was it intimidating? Yeah, you're trying to get. Yeah, it was very intimidating. Yeah. It was very intimidating because remember, it's just them and me. I don't know no one else in the prison. Did any of them try and to test you? Yeah, we, we're gonna get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get there. We're yeah. gonna get there. So what happened is that there was this other black guy called Oki. Yeah, he. He was totally broken, innit? He just broke. Like, I got there before. He was broken. So I already know he cannot be no ally. Do you know what I mean? In this situation. So I just kept my head down. Do you know what I mean? Just kept my head down and just tried to cut through. And then one day, we were sitting down in the, um, in the, um, in the TV room. So the TV room's here. And then there's, a, there's an alleyway where the officers sit, you know, on their high chairs. Mm -hmm. So they can see in the TV room. But there's a TV room on that side and a TV room on that side. So they're looking at both, you know, both TV rooms. That's, that's what association is. And at the end, there's a snooker table. So they're looking at both of these areas so they can watch anything. But obviously, everyone gets laxy daisy sometimes, isn't it? So we're sitting down. And I remember on the telly was, have you seen Mike Tyson? Not the documentary, like the movie they made of Mike yeah. Tyson. Have you mm -hmm. seen that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, that was on the TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that was on the TV. So I'm watching this now, yeah. And there's this mixed race guy, yeah? Now, he's black or white, depending on what day he woke up and what the advantage is. Do you know what I mean? Because when I speak to him by myself, yeah? He's with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But if it kicks off, he's the first one running. He's the first man running, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I even forgot his name, yeah? But I remember we was in the TV room and we was watching this, pro, this Tyson, yeah? And he's saying, yeah, where, where, where? I'm like, bro, be quiet, man. Man's just trying to watch the film, hmm. yeah? He said, no, he does this and he does that. Because he's seen it already, isn't it? Yeah. It's me, bro, just be quiet. And then I remember the guy's name, Russ. Yeah, Russ, Run Valley Skinhead. Bear in mind, they ain't got all skinheads. Some of them have got their hair and that, but that's mm -hmm. what they're called. Yeah, Russ. Now, uh, Russ is a hench guy. Yeah, he's fully on steads. He's turned around and he said, Shut your fucking mouth. Like that, you know, in the Welsh accent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my mum went, Oh, kill I said, See, I told you. I told you to shut up. And my mum turned around and said, You shut your fucking mouth as well. I'm like, What? <laughs> mm -hmm. I said, I was telling him to be quiet. He said, Shut up. I said, Bruh. And then the, the mixed race guy said to me, Q, don't. You know he's saying don't, just don't. Yeah, remember you've been talking like you got my back. Mm -hmm. So you're saying don't like, I don't wanna have to do this. You get know what I'm saying? But he didn't wanna do anything. He's just scared for me and probably scared for himself. Yeah. So I was sitting down, yeah, and I was thinking about it, yeah, but I've been thinking about not just this situation, enough times, even like when I'm walking past the pool table then, and I said, that nigga man. Yeah. Yeah, you heard them talking under their breath. And it's always the there was a little one, a young one, and he was the main antagonist. You know, like the smallest guy was the like he kept on yeah, fucking You know what I mean? Like you hear these things, yeah, but I just sat there that day and I just thought everything just came to me. I just said, you know what, fuck this. And I got up, I said, yo, come to the toilet. He said, What? I said, Yeah, come to come to the bar not the toilet, to the shower. Got the shower once you come out left, the shower's at the end. So I said, Yeah, yeah. I said, bro, I said, bro, it was as well. Stop making noise because you're trying to make the officers see what's going on. You see, see that, it bothered him a lot because he's thinking, you ain't supposed to be that confident. Mm. You're supposed to want to make noise so the officers can see, innit? I'm saying, yo, bro, just shh, let's go to the, yeah? And he's him, come. So he went there, but when he went there, brother around 10 man got up with him. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> 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 I see 10 man get up with him. I'm like, fucking hell, what have mm. I done, yeah? So they've gone out, yeah? And obviously they've walked, they've walked past the officers, mm -hmm. you know, like nice and neat, yeah? And obviously the officer's not thinking nothing. He's probably just reading his newspaper, isn't it? He's just, the lad's going to the shower. So, yeah, I'm thinking, rah, all the men are gonna move to me, yeah? When I go in there. And then they was like, cause, cause obviously they can still see in the window. So as they come, they said, come. I just said, yeah, fuck it. Yeah, I just said, fuck it. I was scared though, but I just said, fuck it. Because I was thinking, you know, I'm tired of being there as well. Getting you know, buried. Like, yeah, with the racism. And, Mental torture. Yeah, and I'm in my cell and I'm thinking, right, oh, what's going to happen today? And is something going to happen today? Am I going to get stabbed in my back? Do you know what I mean? And and some of the officers were horrible as well. Do you know what I mean? So. Were they racist towards you? Yeah, some of them were. Do you know what I mean? 
Like, one time I went to the block down there, and as I got through the block, the thing is, yeah, the, the block's different because it's, it's, you've got to go down. You've got to go down three stairs, and as you go down through the stairs, there's some doors, but they're wooden. They just open up like a trap door. So what if it's the officer that's with you, you, either you can walk down the stairs or they push you down the stairs, yeah? And I remember when I got pushed in, the officer said, get in here, you black bastard. You get me? And once I got in there, through the doors, bam, the officer slapped me straight in my face. I went to, you know, like to, you know, like your body just naturally wants to mm -hmm. defend itself, but I didn't even get to defend myself because by the time he boxed me in my face and I went, there was like officers behind me bam, bam, on the floor. Do you know what I mean? And I heard comments and that. Do you know what I mean? But by then, I'm still used to it. So it's not even a thing that's, you know, like shocking me or anything. Like I've heard that from officers in Felton. So because I'm in this racist jail, them talking like that, that's not bothering me because in my mind I just think that all these officers are like that. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So that never shocked me. It was just kind of more the youths that shocked me. Do you know what I mean? Because I never, I never ever felt racism like that in my life. Like I used to go to boxing matches around the world, well not around the world, around the country, and you used to see looks, but you never used to hear nothing. Do you know what I mean? You could see like a like if oh them guys don't like you because of who you are because mm -hmm. you never met me before so I don't know why you don't yeah. have that feeling as me so you know they've got a problem. You can feel the vibe anyway, yeah, but nobody but, says anything. Yeah, but sometimes, sometimes you go around to these places. These places ain't used to seeing black people, so sometimes that's what it is. You know what I mean? At times when you're young, it's all it's a bit daunting and confusing and scaring. But as you get older and you go around the country, you realize some people just ain't used to seeing black people, and sometimes. They don't know how to approach them. It's just only see them on TV. And then when you're in their presence, they don't know how to deal with you. Do you know what I mean? So in my mind, when I was young, I was thinking it's racism. But sometimes you're led to believe it's racism. Because sometimes when people don't know, if someone's not used to something, they act standoffish. I do. If I'm not used to something, I'm, 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 not, I'm not used to seeing it. Or I'm a bit wary of it, innit? It's like dogs. I don't like dogs. Like if I see dog, you know, you could tell me you, you got the nicest dog in the world. <laughs> I don't care. Because <laughs> yeah. I've been bit by a dog. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So, so the fear's there. Yeah, so it's there. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So sometimes... So it's always there because you'd felt the racism everywhere you've went, every prison. Exactly. You know it's there and you're exactly. always wary of it. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying as I was growing up, until I got to boxing matches, I didn't understand what racism was. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So... Obviously, when I'm when I'm when I'm when I'm going back to my home and saying, "Yo, them people they got to they like me," he says, "Oh, they're probably just racist." Do you know what I mean? It's as simple as that. And then you think, "Oh, that's why they're acting like that." But sometimes, like I said, by growing up, you realize sometimes it's not even racist. It's just that they're not used to you. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's that's why sometimes the feeling when I was young or thought in it was racism it wasn't racism. It was just mm. they're not used to seeing they're not used to black people in that yeah. in that part of the country. Because there is some pe places where black people just don't live. This is England. It's scary to think that yeah. 2020 yeah. and things seem to be taking a turn for the worst again. It's never went away. No, Let's no, be honest. Never it's never yeah, went away. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's scary to think that people judge people through yeah. color, color um, even religion, even mm. where you're from in the world, different countries. It's and, fucking nuts. Yeah, and sometimes it's not even none of those things. Sometimes it's just being able to think for yourself people can be hateful or turn against you, you know, for having a, having, having a different way of thinking, you know, for being yourself or being you. Some people can also, I don't know if it's, it's not racism or discrimination, it's something. Yeah. Like you can be your own person and people will still hate on you for some kind of reason. Of course, we're all judgmental though. As human yeah. beings, we're all judge. We're yeah. all in a weird world where you being unique and being a shown individuality, mm. people are scared of that. People want to all mm. be in the same box. If mm. you don't follow yeah, my rules, exactly. I will force all my, yeah, my exactly. powers onto you because what exactly. I think is right, yeah. when really we all think yeah. differently. There's not yeah. two humans yeah. on this planet is the same. So see when you were doing that with the twenty get the, the ten boys fighting, yeah. What yeah. happened? So basically now I've walked out the room and then obviously the officers are there in it on the side. Mm. I'm thinking, Oof. ten of them 
Do I go in there or I just tell the officer I want to go to my room? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because this is the last chance you're going to get. Do you know what I mean? Once you walk past them officers, that's it. But I just walked past them. I just walked past them and I walked into the shower. When I walked into the shower, it was steamy. You know, like steam. I remember it was mm -hmm. steamy. And then I was holding the door and then the door shut. And then when you go in the shower, there's a cubicle there. Not a cubicle, like a big square. And in that big square, it's just like some sinks and a toilet. And then through here, there's like a, like a door here with no door. You know, that's a space of a door. You go through there and then that's the shower. Yeah, and it's a big square. And I've got in there now. When I've got in there now, these motherfuckers are taking their tops off. Do you get what I'm saying? There's already guys in the shower already. Yeah? They're already in the shower, you know, like naked. You know, just showering up, showering up. And then there's a blockage in the, in the shower. So it's like the water's not fully going, you know, through the drainage. Yeah. So where it's not fully going through the drainage, the water is around this high. Like a puddle? Yeah, like a puddle, isn't it? Yeah. Right? So these guys are taking off their tops. But it's, I, when I thought they were taking off their tops, I thought they were taking off their tops because they were all going to do me in. Yeah, but they were taking off their tops because they wanted to get in the shower as well, yeah? But then this one guy, the guy Russ, yeah, he took off his top. And then when he took off his top now, like the whole, the whole of the shower opened up and they've created like a circle, yeah? And he's in the middle going, come on, come on! <laughs> you know, like in a boxing stance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, bro, I might be able to win this if he wants to do boxing. Do you mm -hmm. get what I'm saying? So we got in there, started, started, you know, like, Flicking them out, flicking yeah, yeah. them out, flicking them out. And then he tried to hold me. And when he tried to hold me, I could feel how strong he was. Do you get me? Yeah? And I didn't really want to be in that situation. Yeah? So, got out, started fingering again. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to have to go for it. Yeah? You get me? So I gave him a combination. And when I hit him, I saw his eye, you know, just bust. Like, just fully bust. And then it bust, and then it started to close. Yeah? So I'm he, like, they're saying now, come on, Russ, Welsh power, get him. Welsh power. Welsh power, yeah, that's what they're saying, I remember. <laughs> Welsh power. Yeah. So, and, I'm, and, and they're shouting, there's lots of them, you know, there's at least, at, there's at least at 20 people in the shower now, because there was some in there before. And you can hear all this Welsh talk, come on, Russ. And then, but I'm trying to talk to him, and I'm saying, Russ, I know you don't want to fight me because his face is kind of fucked to get mm -hmm. me and he's a bit dizzy. I'm saying, you don't want to fight me and he's looking at me. I know he don't really want it. And see, because I, I know he don't really want it, yeah? I don't really want to mash him up. Do you know what I'm saying? I know now you're in here because of your ego, but you're in here now because of these guys. Do you know what I'm saying? So I'm looking at him and I'm saying, Russ, don't. And then he just said, ah! So what I done is, when he done all that, I just stood to, stood, stood to the side and went bang and he dropped again. So I went over him, and as I went over him, the only thing I remember is I woke up on my back, you know, in that first room, you know, the room before you get mm -hmm. into the shower. I woke up and the officer was going, Fritz, what happened? That's all I remember. So as I went over him, one of them put me in the sleeper. And that's all I remember. Do you know what I mean? But the next day, no one... No one gave me any grief. Did you earn your respect then? Which I was surprised about. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, the next day it's going to go off, they're going to move to me. But then there's this neck. Remember I told you the black guy was called Oki? Yeah. There was this next guy called Ogi, yeah? But he seemed to be a top man in the, in the Welsh side, yeah? He came to me, he came to my door. He said, yeah, no one's going to trouble you. Da -da 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 -da. Bloody, bloody. And that was the end of it. After that, I got a job on the servery. And there's this guy, his name was Mr. Richards. He was an Asian man. But what he used to do is, I think he hated them. You know, the racist ones. Mm -hmm. So what he used to do is, when I was on the servery, when any of them come past them, you know, like, he used to make jokes like, yeah. And if you have anything to say, I'll get freaks to punch you up. I'm thinking, fucking no. <laughs> yeah. Don't <laughs> yeah. fucking say shit like that, mate. Do you so know what I mean? So you it before with a wee bit? Yeah, yeah. I said, don't, don't say yeah. stuff like that, mate. You get me in trouble, mate. I yeah. thought that was only in, like, yeah. American Jews. No. Yeah. Yeah. Like the white no. brotherhood and shit. No, 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 no. The Rondon Valley Skinners. Trust me, you probably could get an interview with one of them guys one day. 
the Rundin Valley skin. Fucking <laughs> hell. <laughs> so why it. did you get put in that prison? Was that too, because, for that to happen, do you think? Maybe, because like I said, on my record, I fight officers and when they see stuff like that and you go to prisons, they're always just, they're ready for you. So anything you do, do won't go under the radar. It will all get yeah. noted down and the patterns. Because all I, when I look through my records, all I've had through the records is he's anti, what is it? Anti-authority. Yeah. I've had that from young, but it ain't that I'm anti-authority. It's just that, remember, I've been controlled for so long, innit? it? Mm-hmm. You know, like, say from my... Like a loose cannon. Yeah, basically. so I just keep rebelling. Tell me this then. So to tell me what to when do. you went to that prison, every other prison you fought... The screws, you fought yeah. every day. Yeah. When you went to that prison, yeah. did you fight any screws? No. Nope. So it worked, basically? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean, though? Yeah, yeah, because you've not got yeah, all yeah, your friends. Yeah. You're yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Again, that yeah. guy you were fighting in yeah. the shower, yeah, he's yeah. been, it sounds like yeah. me, it's peer pressure yeah, yeah. to go and do that as well 100%. when he doesn't want to do it. Yeah, yeah, so if yeah. you're in the prison as yeah. well, mm. maybe people know your stepdad, heard about your dad as well. You've got to mm. kind of live up to that hype as well. Mm. So if mm. you get took out the environment, mm. then it's a case of, wait a minute, this is new. I need to adapt. It's true. So yeah, yeah it's fucked up though. Yeah. It's, it's and how up. old were you then? Um, as I was coming out of there, I was probably around 17 as I come out of Portland. That was my first sentence. My mum picked me up from from um, prison with my aunt. How was your relationship with your mum at that um, time? At that time, it was getting better because she wasn't with him no more. So it was just like how it should have been, kind of, without him controlling everything that's been going on in our life. So yeah, we started to get more son and motherly. Build a bond. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So and everywhere and and anywhere I went to prison, my mum would always come and visit me. She's the one person I could rely on and that. Do you know what I mean? She sent me money every month. She'd send me stuff in the post, CDs. That's the one person that I could say had my back. That's the one that's always there when the shit yeah, hits yeah, the fan, yeah, not yeah, the boys yeah, you've yeah. grew up with, not nah, none of them. anybody else's nah, I didn't your see mother none of them. on it. That has nah, to do the sentence with you. Yeah. So when you were 18, 19, 20, you were still in prison? Were you just getting moved about yeah, constantly? So basically, so basically I came out after my mum picked me up, I was living at home, and then what happened is I just got caught up in robberies again. No, them same robberies we was doing before. Mm-hmm. Um, started doing them and then started smoking crack, basically. Started to go into all, you know, like the name brand parties and just being around. Remember now I've got, an, uh, now I've got even a, uh, a bigger name, you know, after coming out of prison and doing all of that. So I've come out of prison, I've tried to live up to that, i.e. drugs, clothes, parties. Wasn't really fighting anymore. You know, after the, like, the fighting part of me has kind of been established. Are you tired of it? No, I wasn't. I was I was up for it, but there wasn't really any contenders at that time. You know, like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, like, pussies. Remember, yeah, yeah. Remember, we, remember we've done the jail circuit. Yeah. So now your name's kind of... So you know of, everybody that's dodgy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, from north, east, west or south. Do mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So it was more, more of just get this money and look like you're making money kind mm-hmm. of vibe. Yeah, so... But then within five, six months, I was back in prison again. Yeah. Yeah, so went back to prison um, for robbery, got a five years, and came out when, when, and that prison sentence was probably this, ex- nearly the same as that one. Because in my mind, I was coming back out not to change my life, I was just coming back out to carry on with my criminal career. But this time, I made a mental note that I would never smoke crack again. That's the one thing I've done. What was the turning point at that moment? Um, I don't know, because I think I saw, I saw, I, I, I used to smoke crack because it was cool, because I saw my olders doing it. But then by the time I got to, because I think I was around 20 then, by the time I came out from my second son, by the time I got to that age, my olders, I haven't seen them for years. So there was no influence from them. I think it was just of me being in prison so many times and wanting something different. Because I said, yeah, that's what I said. I said, I'd never rob again. I'd never do the robberies and I'd never smoke crack. That's what I said. That's what I made the mental note. So when I came out and there was hardly any money, when people were telling me to come on robberies, I said, nah, nah, I'm all right, I'm good. But then what happened is my sister was going out 
with someone I knew called Tipsy. And he um, had um, basically the greatest phone line ever. You know, they say they, they call them county lines now. This weren't county, this was just in Camden, yeah? And it was like 10 guys lines in one. Do you know what I mean? Like this, this phone line has no word of a lie. It could be make around seven grand a day. Every day. Just 24 seven. Just 20, no, no, it's not even 24 seven. It's 10 to 10. Yeah. And then he gives someone the phone for a night shift and charges them. Do you know what I mean? Five bills. Anyone that's worked the night shift, you give you give him five hundred pounds, he make you work the night shift. But from that ten to ten, ten to ten, there's gonna be at least seven grand of cash going through your hands. Easily. Yeah. So he told me, yeah, you can have that. Do you know what I mean? He said, I'm chilling out for a while. Me and your sister's gonna just do what we gotta do. And so I was doing that for a little while. But then what happened is we kind of, like, cause we, got, cause we had the line, we was able to control the prices of drugs in the community. You know, like people who want to buy things like ounces and stuff. So because we had the line making so much money, all right, just say you had a, a kilo and you bought it for 20,000, just say that, yeah? Now, I bought a kilo for 20,000 too, but I've got a phone line that makes me seven grand every day, yeah? So now what I'm going to do is I can take losses on my kilo. You can't, you know, because of the line. Mm -hmm. So what we done is drop the price of the ounces because you're only selling them for 650. I'm selling them for 450, but I can take the loss because I can balance it out with the phone line. Yeah. Yeah, so you see that. When we done that, we just thought that was a great business idea. Unbeknown to us, all the other drug dealers wasn't happy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But we didn't know that at the time. We was just um, doing what we thought was all right for us, innit? We, you know, we're men, we can do what we want. You know, that kind of vibe. We wasn't thinking about the rest of the community or anyone else. So once that kind of filtered down, a lot of haters started to appear, but we couldn't see them because we was just in our own bubble. So what happened is now is people around us also started to get jealous because they wasn't reaping as much benefits as we was, yeah? So with that, people around you start talking to them people and they start coming to the agreements, yeah? So one day, um, what happened was um, my friend, you are talking about, he goes out like, my sister. He um he phoned me, because he see me, uh, I, me and my friends, but I still mind my own business. He over my sister, and obviously my sister, so your family, innit? Yeah? So, they're doing what they're doing, but me, on a day-to-day -day basis, I've got the phone. I'm not really hanging around with anybody. I'm just doing what I'm doing, my workers, etc. So I just mind my own business. So he's phoned me one day, and he said to me, yo, Come and meet me now. I said, brother, I'm working. And I know he, he's a man. If if he gets complaints from, from the customers saying, oh yeah, they never had no this or they never had that when I phoned up, he's going to be angry, isn't it? Yo, bruv, that's what he said. He said, the line's supposed to work like McDonald's. We're not supposed, we're not supposed to be short of anything. If they come and they, and they don't, if it keeps happening, you're going to get sacked off the line, isn't it? So if he's telling me to forget the line and come and meet him now, I knew it was serious, isn't it? So I've, I've, come and, I've come and met him now. Come, come and met him in a place called Camberwell. Do you know what that is? No. It's in, it's in, it's in South London. It's not, far from, it's not far from Brixton. See the front line where I told you my dad used to be? Mm -hmm. It's one straight road from Brixton. You go to Camberwell. The Nando's is at the end, right on the, in, in, in the corner, top of Camberwell Road. So I pulled up at the Nando's. Now, before I pulled up at the Nando's, um, he told me what happened. He said, oh, bro. He said, Reds, yeah, that was some guy that was hanging around with us, yeah, has basically um, took something of some people and, and he's disappeared. I said, okay, so what's that got to do with you? Do you know what I mean? Because obviously Reds is around us, but Reds is not your friend. 
Reds is, Reds is your friend's friend. And he's from Bristol. So you ain't bring Reds around us. So that's not our business. Yeah? So, but you see, because I'm so confident in, in myself and my upbringing, I've realised there's people out there that can't make them decisions like that. You know, like, someone puts that to you, like, what's that got to do with you? Some people start thinking, raw, it might affect me because I don't want people to think because I'm around them that I'm anything to do with it. But you're always going to get that, but I haven't got time to think like that. Like, if I'm not involved in something, I'm just not involved in it. If I am involved in it, you're going to know I'm involved in it, yeah? But some people around us ain't got the strength or the confidence to tell someone, that's none of my business. Do you know what I mean? Because I don't know, maybe you were scared of them when they were growing up and stuff like that, but I've never had to feel like that when I was growing up because of my stepdad. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so my friend being kind of wary of people made him not make a decision for himself. He made it because he was a bit scared. Yeah. So after they after after him and these guys had a meeting, he went to go with them to look for his friend. Well, not his friend, but you know the guy Reds. Because they said, Yeah, we want the stuff back. And if we don't get the stuff back, you are in you're in you're involved. They didn't say that to me. Because these people are from my area. They would never say nothing like that to me. But they said it to him. Obviously, because they know they used to go to school with him, maybe they had some kind of fear over him or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So as they finished the meeting, he was walking off with them. I said to him, bro, where are you going? What, what are you going to do? Go with them guys and look for your friend. These are the same guys that been hating on you for years. Forget them. You get me? I'm confident enough to say that. Yeah? Is him, yeah, true, 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 true. So we went about our business. The next day now, some girl phoned me, yeah, that I used to go out with, who now goes out with my friend's friend. Phoned me and said, are you going out tonight? I'm like, because we go out every Friday. So you're going out tonight? I'm like, what do you mean am I going out tonight? He said, oh yeah, you're going out tonight. I said, yeah, why? He said, okay, I'll phone you back. I thought, right, that's weird. Because the last time you was at my house, I told you, I can't have you phoning my phone no more because I got a new thing around me, innit? And you keep phoning my phone. And that was the last time I see her, innit? And that was that same house where, I, where, where I'm going to explain to you happens now. So after she asked me my guy now, she said, yeah. I said, yeah. And I said to my friend, Ra, she just phoned me and said, my guy now. But forget that anyway. You get me? Forget that. That's what I said. Forget that anyway. Let's go out. So now, but that Reds guy, he's actually in our house with us. Do you know what I mean? It's me, Reds, and Tipsy, and Bugsy. So... We've gone out the house now. As, as, as I, no, I've walked out the house. As I've walked out the house, I've seen, um, you know, like a beam, bright beams come onto me, yeah? And then another bright beam came onto me across the road. So what I'd done is, I don't know why I'd done it, I just fought quick. I ran over to a bush and pretended I was getting something out the bush. And as I'd done that move, they just went, Rah! and they drove off. I sat back in the house and I thought, Rah. no one don't know where we live. Obviously, that girl knows where I live. Set up. Yeah. And what I found out is, the guy that she was going out with, he's been giving information to them, to the other side. Remember when I said there's people around you mm -hmm. that are more wary of them people, so they start, they start infiltrating, so they, they come out of the trouble. So basically, he started giving them information to show them, I'm not with these lot. Do you know what I mean? You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's what he done. And, that, and he kept on giving the information, but somehow, by the grace of God, we kept on getting away. Yeah? But we kept on getting away. But then one day, because we kept on getting parties. And as we come at the parties, remember, we we're high in that, but not high off crack or anything. Sometimes we'd be taking a bit of MDMA, because um, we're getting garage raving, MDMA, champagne, weed. And every time we come at the parties, Cars are pulling up and shooting at us, and we're just just about getting away. So um, I just said to one day, I just said, you know what, I'm not having this no more, innit? Like, forget it. So one day, I just bought, I just bought Uzi. 
I bought Uzi basically. I think I paid around five grand for it. And um, I, I got it and I put it down. And I was just chilling at my mate, um, Ashleen's house in King's Cross. And King's Cross was near Camden. So it was a like, perfect little situation for me. And I could just go to her house, still make money, bloody bloody. And I'm sitting down on the sofa one day, and I remember, I remember specifically, yeah, it said, it's the day of, what carnival, was it Luton Carnival? I think it was Luton, Luton have a carnival, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the day of Luton Carnival, it was in May. And I was sitting down, and I said to myself, if anyone phones you today, don't go out. I remember, I remember saying it to myself, don't go out. Yeah, I remember I had the thing parked behind her, behind her cupboards. Like, she didn't even know it was in her house. You know what I mean? It's just parked behind her cupboard. And um But 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 sorry, but by by this time, the reason I'm staying at her house is because Tipsy and my friend Maniac, they've been chased by police and they threw a gun at the window. And and they found drugs at one of his addresses. So they're already in jail, yeah? So I'm thinking, right, it's just me out here by myself and my mate Bugsy. Yeah, so the flat that we was in, I moved out of it and went to stay with that girl's at King's Cross. So I'm there now. Like I said, um, they said, I said to myself, don't go out. As that phone call, as, as I said that to myself, I got a phone call. It's my mate, Bugsy. He's in, bro, I got my bike, my motorbike. Let's ride out. Let's look for these guys. Because obviously they've been to his house, put the shotgun through the door. And you know, like pull the trigger, you know, in his hostel that he was staying at. So he was kind of, you know, like, we need to do something. Otherwise, these people are getting onto us. Do you know what I mean? So he's come to look for me now. I got in the back of the bike and um, I've got the Uzi. Um, but I've got like a bandana tied around it, you know, around the, um, I forgot what it's called, you know, the stock. You know the thing you put, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, unfold yeah. it and mm -hmm. you pull it under yeah. there. Yeah, I had a, like a bandana. Yeah, so I had a bandana under my arm and I had to put the thing over my chest. You know, so when I'm on the back of the bike, mm -hmm. the person behind me can't see it. Yeah. So I was just riding like that. So we was riding through the whole of South London, South, South London, everywhere, looking for these guys, looking for these guys, anyone connected to them. Um, we didn't find no one. Were you going to kill people? Yeah, at that stage, I did. Mm -hmm. I did. I was, I was furious. They, they, um, they shot up a car with my sister in it. I've had my sister crying. Um, my friend Tipsy's come downstairs. He's been chased. I've been chased out of excess, excess amount of parties. So in my mind, these people are trying to kill me, so I'm going to be trying to kill them. Kill or be killed? Yeah, that's, that's how it felt at the time. So, um, yeah, I'm, looking, I'm, I'm just driving around looking for them, looking for them. And then what happens is we're driving down a road I think it's called Milkwood Road. It's in Brixton, yeah? This is all logged, by the, by the way, yeah? This is all logged. This is all known, known stuff. Driving down Milkwood Road, and there's a girl that we know. And I stop. I said, yo, have you seen any of them guys? Yeah? She said, no, but be careful. And why be careful? He said, oh, because a lot of people are talking about you. Yeah? I said, okay. I mean, no problem. So as I've left her, I've took a left, and I'm driving past my cousin's house, and I see a group of guys outside my cousin's house. So I'm thinking, wow, is this them? You get me? So as we drew past, I pulled off my motorbike helmet. And as I pulled off the motorbike helmet, police van pulled up. Beside, you know, like, right behind us. So I just put the motor helmet on and just said, yo, Bugsy, drive. So he's driving, we've stripped off the feds, but then he doesn't live far from where he was. And he said he had a car outside his house. So we thought, yeah, let's get off the bike and get into the car, because obviously the police are looking for the bike. So we got into his car now. And as we got into his car, it was a rental. I remember it was a rental. Got into the car, it's it like a black Astro. Got into the car and I said, and I've, I've looked into the rear view mirror and I said, bro, take your, um, you know, I saw his bike light on still. I said, get your bike light off. You see, as soon as I told him to turn his bike lock off, he stepped out of his car, and as soon as he put his foot on the pavement, all I heard was, pop, 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 pop. I'm like, raw. I looked into my rear view, into my wing mirror, and I'm seeing like 
two or three, I can't remember. It's it definitely no, no, no less than two guys with balaclavas, all black clothing, guns in their hands, trying to, you know, tiptoe to, you know, to my door. Yeah. Bearing in mind, yeah, I haven't even tested the Uzi. For all I know, it don't work, but the person I get off, I know they wouldn't do that. Do you know what I mean? So, I put it out the window and nothing happened. Because all it is is there was a switch, a switch. You safety. know, that switch of safety, yeah. So I just took that off and just assumed that it would do that, yeah? And I know, and, and then I, and from this side, I can see Bugsy now. He's got his, he's got his like, I don't know what he had. He had like a handgun, automatic. But he was just, you know, shooting back at them. And I can still hear all the ping, 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 ping. So all I've done is there was some fucking round thing on top. You know, like I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm panicking really. Do you know what I mean? I've just pulled that, you know that thing? It's just, there's a thing on the top of it. It's like a, a round knob. You just pull it. And when I pull it, I heard it go. <laughs> it's like, you know, like a selector. Mm -hmm. So you know, like on a normal handgun, you go. Put a glock it back. Yeah, but there was no clocking back. There was a, there's a thing on top, like a round circle. And you feel like it's got a spring on it. You pull it back and that was it. So then I just pull it out the window, yeah? And I just went, like that. And when I looked, they were running now. So where they're running now, that's giving me energy, in it. So I got out the car, like, you know, no aim. You know, just movie stuff. Just went, Sprayed that? Yeah, just sprayed it. Like, you can hear it hitting the doors of all the car. Yeah? And then you can hear them. Like, you know, coming over the car, like, ping, 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 ping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's getting me more excited because mm. I know now I'm in control of, of what's going on, innit? So I'm just going up the road, saying, yo, stop hiding. You know, like, I'm screaming, come out, come out. You want to you wanna shoot? Come shooting up the place. And then um, what happened was I saw a, um, there was like an old man and a, and, a, and a little girl and it was hiding, you know, you know, by the side of the car. You get me? And then, man, they kept on shooting, yeah? So I just, I don't know what made me do it, yeah? But I just, I just fired the gun in the air and said, I think I said stop or something. And I told them to, you know, to come across the road because they were trying to get across the road. And, and, I, and, and I don't know why I done it, yeah? But it was a lucky thing I did do it because the judge said, if you didn't do that, you'd have got over 20 today. He said, I don't know why you done it. Obviously, you shouldn't be shooting in the streets. But he said, you cared enough to, you know, put your own life at risk for the old man and the old and the little girl, yeah. But the prosecutor weren't having it. He was saying, nah, the reason he done this is because he does this every day. Do you know what I mean? Like he's a professional, he's a professional. But the judge didn't take what he said in consideration because he knew a professional gunman and just a guy acting reckless on the street is two different things. So you know, if you're if you're the le if you're the latter and you're still trying to help people, even though you've created a situation in his eyes, yeah, he said he's gonna keep me, you know, down into consideration. So, yeah, that happened. And then while that happened, the guys ran off, basically. You know, like they took it as an opportunity to cut out. And obviously now, I'm pumped up and I haven't really used this thing properly in my mind, because ain't, there ain't nobody dead. Yeah, I said to myself, I ain't finished yet. Do you know what I mean? So I phoned a couple of the couple of other boys I know. They linked me up, and we just started to drive around the whole of you know the nightclub scene, the whole of the nightclub scene in South London, looking for these guys. So now we're all dressed up, long jackets, bulletproof, bulletproof vests. You know, like we proper linked up and got all of you know everything we've got together mm -hmm. to go on. Look for these guys. So we drove up to Pearly Way. And we drove up to Pearly Way. And I've jumped out the car as soon as we got into the car park. And I've um I started putting my head in people's cars, you know, like trying to see who's in the back. Like I could see who's in the front. But it was it was very rude of what I was doing, you know what I mean? Like, you know, there's there's a, there, there, there's cars lined up to get into a party, and I just jumped out of my car. Looking, but obviously they can see what's in my hand and that in it, because I'm not hiding it. I've just got it out in my hand, and I'm looking at people's cars. And then there was a little young boy who that was with us. Yeah, he saw me doing that. He had a gun as well, and he tried to do the same thing in it. But he was doing the same thing, 
But then I just heard him scream, Quincy, Quincy, help me. I'm thinking, what the fuck? I turned around and I've seen around six guys, you know, like stamping on him, stamping on him, stamping on him. And, and I can hear them saying, yo, get his gun, get his, you know, like they're trying to get it. So once I've heard that, I've run over there and I've just gone, just like a sweep with the machine. And I heard the same noise, you know, when he hits all the cars and that. And then I've heard someone screaming. So basically, it was one of the guys that was stamping him out. So he's grabbed his gun and I said, come, let's go. We've jumped in our car. He's in the car behind. So there was a BMW with us, like a five series, and we was in a gold A3. So as I've jumped back in the car with the driver, yeah, you know, the, the young boy is the driver actually. Yeah, the young boy is the driver. So we got into the gold car. Then there's three of my Cody's there in the BMW behind me. So Dave went and drove off, yeah? So what is it? Because I've been going, I've been doing a bit bit too much of it. I didn't know how much. Billet she had left. Yeah, so, so I looked, but you see as I looked and pulled the thing, it's like, I don't know, it's like, I was nervous. Maybe I pushed the trigger slightly by accident and then the bullet went through, you know, the, um, the dashboard and the car just, Conked out, you know. By that time, it's all cars, all electrics in it. Just conked out, and conked out, and I'm thinking, right, what are we gonna do now? Police cars pulled up behind us, yeah, and it's just, you know, it's just got its light on. Woo, 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 woo. I don't know how them lot knew, but they just fucking reversed, reversed all the way up to us, and we jumped out our car, jumped in their car. So now there's five of us in this BMW, yeah, and there's around probably around three, three guns in there now. So um. We're driving, driving up down Pearly Way. I've told a guy to either go left or right, and he's done the opposite of what I said, you know, because he's panicking. So I think he, I think he went left, and I said to go right. He went left. So he's gone left. It's like industrial places. So now he's brought us back all the way back, you know, to the party again. Yeah. So as we got to the party, and I remember there's bare police already out there, and. Every road now that we drive past, there's police. You know, like, so you're driving down the road, there's police joining the chase. So I'm driving down that way, down the main road, and there's police on every, you know, side road. Mm -hmm. So as we drive past them, they're joining in, yeah? So now there's so much blue, yeah? Sirens, yeah? That in the car is blue. Do you know what I mean? Everything is blue. That's how much, like, it's like, it's like they're, it's like they're transporting us somewhere, you know, because they're, they're at the sides, they're on every road, there's helicopters, everything's just flashing blue. So I'm saying to myself, I remember I said to them, I said, how's man going to get away? And man said they don't know. So I said, bro, I'm not going back to jail, no. What do you mean you're not going I'm not going back to jail, bro. But I said, you know what, bro, I'm going to shoot. And I remember when everyone in the car saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. So I just said, bruv, how do you think we're going to get away? He said, we're fucked. Look, there's police down there, there's police behind us, police at the side of us. And no one was talking, so I just pulled it out the window. I didn't look. I just pulled it out the window and I just went, do 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 I probably done that twice and the magazine was finished. Threw the gun out the window as we were driving. And then my other friend, he had, a, he, had a, he had a gun as well. And I said, bruv, you gonna use it or what? And he said, no, he just threw it down on the floor, you get me? So I picked it up, I probably shot around twice of it, and then I just let, let it, you know, just put it back in the, in, this, in, the, in the footwell. And then we were driving for a little bit, and then the car crashed. And when the car crashed, I was about to jump out, but it crashed into one of them, you know the um, fences in the middle of the road? So as I went to jump out, he, he kind of reversed and got it to, you know, come back out of the thing. So we drived, drived, and then we drive, and then I felt the wheel, the, you know, you know they put them stingers in the road? Yeah, busted yeah. tires. Yeah, and the wheels <clears throat> felt funny, and then once the wheels went, one of the steering wheel went. So as that wheel was going, I jumped out the car. But when I jumped out the car, there was like, you know them police with the, the hats on and that and they had the MP5s they said don't move don't move but 
I was so scared, I just ran straight past him. I remember there's other people coming out the car from behind me, so it's like they're kind of more concentrated on them. So I just kept running and, you know, you got, you got roads of houses and then they got the little space for the garden between each houses. I just darted through one of them. And um, remember dogs, remember I don't like dogs. <laughs> so I've gone, <laughs> I've gone into this back garden, there's dogs, yeah? I was so scared, yeah? I did not even have a chance to, you know, jump the fence, yeah? I ran through the fence. You know them? <laughs> <laughs> bruv, like a cartoon. Bruv, listen, you know them, fen them wooden fences them wooden fence that people have in their garden? There's long strips of woods and they're just wood, wood, yeah. side by side, mm -hmm. side. Bruv, I ran through them. <laughs> bruv, all you could hear in people's <laughs> gardens was, pat, pat, pat. I never had the strength or yeah. anything to, to do any of that. I just mm -hmm. kept on running. Somehow, I was just going through them. Mm -hmm. Bam, bam, bam. And obviously, that was waking up the dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And then I got to a, a point where there was a big kind of like forest place. Not forest, but just greenery. And I was stuck there, yeah? And the helicopter was going off. Helicopter was going off, and I'm thinking, I'm gonna get caught here, innit, yeah? Right? And when I was thinking that, I got so scared, bruv, yeah? I had to shit on the floor. I just had to shit there. I couldn't even hold it, bruv. I just remember I just, sh I just shat. I just pulled my trousers down and just shat in the corner, bruv. That's how I was trembling. Like, I've never been, you know, that scared because I know, mm. I know what I've come from, I know what I've done, and I can see that they're onto me, innit? But in the, um, in, when the helicopter was going round, yeah, there was a long tree. Yeah, and I knew I couldn't make it all the way to the other side without that thing getting me. So I kind of like, I kind of, and, and not even just that. You see, I'm so scared. My legs are only taking me so far. Like jelly. Yeah, like I can only get so far. So like, I'd like to run, but my body is trembling so much I can't. So what I've done is, I hid under the tree, you know, for a while. It was a big oak tree, but it was just like positioned so it weren't fully on the floor. Some of it was still up. So I stood under there and I, while it was going round for a while, I just stayed lying down. And then when it got, you know, like just past me, I ran and just kind of like ran behind it. And then just kept on running, running, running until I ran from Fort Eneve to Crystal Palace, got in a cab and went straight to, um, went straight back to that girl's ass chilled out and then nearly everybody in that car got away except for one person his leg got trapped you know as he was trying to jump out the finger bob so they started phoning me i was on the run for around i don't know eight days this is like the worstest days of my life forget me because i kept on i knew i couldn't turn on the phone to make money because i knew the feds had the the, oh. the numbers because they already arrested my friend mm -hmm. you know what i mean so um and then obviously i throwed the gun out Fingerprints. No, yeah, I've got no gun, but no, but the funniest thing is, you know, the gun ended up back in the car, you know, when I got arrested. I like, threw it out the window, but then when I got arrested, it was in the footwell. Don't know how that happened, but that's a, that's a whole other story. Yeah. So my, 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 my prints ended up in the, the Uzi in the footwell with my prints on it. Yeah. Um, when you threw it out the first time, did it have prints? Um, do you know what? More than likely. Yeah. More than likely. You know mm. what I mean? I wasn't. So when they I never caught, had gloves yeah, on so or nothing. So when they caught you again, they put that in your possession. Yeah, so basically what they've done is they've, 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 they've connected me to the car by, by saying, we saw you in this car three months ago because they found a receipt in the car and that car was used to get petrol in Camden. So they can say that they've tied me to the car already. Mm -hmm. But what they want to do is tie the gun to the car. And blame you. And say it was me. Because Obviously, you might have had the pill the to get somebody else to take the blame, maybe. Yeah, I could have done all of that in it. But what 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 it was is, yeah, when I went, when I when they gave me my fourteen years, and based on remember that story I told you where he would have gave me more than twenty. Yeah. He said <clears> if they said in my appeal, if I come back to court, they're gonna start my sentence again because they think, yeah, that I got off lightly. Even though I got 14 and my Cody's got 10 and six years. That is likely though if you're shooting at the coppers. No, 100%. Do you know what I mean? That's 100%. a life sentence. That's a yeah, 20 rate, 25 rate. And, and, the, and the thing about it is, you see, because I had the robberies, <clears throat> the robberies in the past, they tried to do a thing called 
was it three strikes and out or two strikes and out? You know, because mm-hmm. violent American offender. Style, yeah. yeah, but I had to prove. Remember before when I was telling you that um, there was no violence involved in the robberies, but they termed it steaming, so they could get us into crown court to give us more sentence. So what they done is the, they tried to say, yeah, this guy's gonna get a life sentence today. Cause I know, cause I know my cr- criminal career and my past. I knew I hadn't touched no one in none of them robberies. So what they done is they re- they 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 read every you know manuscript for every robbery case I done, yeah, and saw that there was no violence in them, and that's the only reason I didn't get life. Mm-hmm. If there was any violence in any of them robberies, they weren't robberies; they're called steamings. It was a term that they used to class it as robbery. If it wasn't for none, I'd, if I touched any of them people in any of them robberies, I would have got life. Mm-hmm. But because I knew I hadn't, I was confident of. How is it now? To read manuscripts. Talking about that, how do you feel speaking about that? About the shootings and shooting out the window with not looking, especially after taking the old man, the girl across the road, potentially you shooting out the window, you could have hurt someone. How do you feel that you never hurt hurt anybody? I feel relieved that I didn't hurt anyone. Yeah. And not just because of it would have stopped me from getting life and changed all my family's life out here, but I didn't plan to kill no police. Like, the only purse of people that I was trying to hurt was the people that were trying to hurt me. Like, I know, and I definitely know that's what I was trying to do. The police just kind of got caught up in my madness. They, I wasn't out to hurt them or nothing like that. It was just, of, it was just a thing of, I feel that I've been wronged and I'm out here right now trying to get revenge on the people that have been trying to kill me. And it just so happens that the police just approached me on the wrong day. On any other day, I would have tried to dare do that, but because I was already on this buzz that, you know, like I've been getting chased down for long and now I'm in control, you know, where I've got the bigger gun and I've seen what they're capable of. I just wanted to kind of rectify me being getting chased down for months. Do you know what I mean? Like there was no personal vendetta against the police or mm-hmm. it was just me thinking no I can't go back to prison so you were doing whatever it takes to try and get away to try and get away not realising it's going to make your life worse yeah you what know, was your mum saying at this time when you got your 14 um, my mum was devastated didn't it because it's just like 3, 5, 14 and and I remember at, the t- and at that time at the time I got my 14 my sister, that tipsy, he died, didn't he? He got killed. Like, he came out for home leave and they killed him. Do you know what I mean? And then... The same ones that were trying to kill you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she she got another boyfriend and he got killed too. So, that that by that time, and I'm, I'm me getting my sentence, my mum was just crushed, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Like, the whole family's crushed. Obviously, my sister's out there and she's had to two past boyfriends that have just been killed. The brothers doing a life, huh? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a lot. Obviously, they're not not with Vincent no more. So, it's just like, you know, it's just women by their self. And how was he in the whole thing? Did you ever speak to him? No, he Never? was... Never? No, no, he was... You see, like, kind of from when he left my mum, that was kind of the end of the... anything that could be. Do you know what I mean? Because obviously, my mum's been trying to get that relationship for years. And she one day she just gathered the strength to do it. Do you know what I mean? So there was never really no talking between us or anything. I've only really talked to him since I've been out this time, like mm. halfway through. So what was your family events? Yeah. So yeah, fourteen then. What was life like then when you realised sitting in a dock? Fourteen when, years. Four, oh, oh, four, I thought you meant yeah. four, fourteen years of age. Yeah. Um, the the first the first I remember the first thing that I done when they gave me a fourteen years. I was, um, because I was in the, um, you remember the dome robbers? Yeah. Yeah, we was in the same court cells as them. Do you know what I mean? And some other probably famous shootings that were happening at the time. But I didn't really care. I I came in the cell and I just went on my knees. And I said, I said, God, please don't let this, uh, don't let this, don't let this, don't let this affect me. As in, i.e., don't let this, you know, break me. Because remember, I already know how evil prison can be. 
and then now you're telling me I got to sit in there for a decade. Yeah, I'm, I just prayed. I said, please God, please, please just don't let this um, hurt me, H affect me. That's it, and I trust everything will be okay. And that was it. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go on anymore. I didn't go on. Anymore. I just sat down, um, and I, 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 I quietly felt confident that I would be okay. But only because of that moment with God, I only thought I'd be okay. Like he, like when I asked him, it just made me feel like he was gonna sort it. Like I, 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 I don't know. I just, like a protection? Yeah, I just, at that moment in time, I just felt it. I asked for it and that was it. I just sat down mm -hmm. and I just thought, mm. It's funny life that I speak to murderers, bank robbers, mm. people with addictions. Mm. And when you get to a ver certain breaking point, you realise, we all know what's right and what's wrong. No matter in life, sometimes mm. you can get conditioned where you think mm. it is normal, but we do know right and wrong. But there comes a point where you, you turn to someone, you just mm. think, this ain't normal. Mm. Shooting out cars or murders and mm. robberies, it ain't normal. And we kind of, there's no guidance, but we mm. look for a higher power. Someone yeah. to try and guide us and say, look, I'll not do this again if you can just guide me. Mm. We all want protected. We're all it's vulnerable. Bad, We're all scared. Now, mm. you, I can interview the biggest and baddest mm. man on this planet, but I guarantee he will have vulnerabilities. Holding mm. a gun and a knife for me is a vulnerability. Mm. That's not a bad man. Mm. That, that is a weakness. Mm. And I always say it, that is their comfort blanket mm. because you've been bullied mentally, physically, maybe mm. at a younger age. The mm. knife or the gun becomes a protection. Mm. I'm going to hold this. Please don't hurt me anymore. Mm. But I will drill fear into you because I know that will keep you mm. away. But it, it never really keeps anybody away because no, there's doesn't. always somebody mm. who's wanting to get that reputation coming mm. through the ranks. Maybe their stepdad, maybe mm. their father. You were at that age where you were trying to live up to a hype watching the gangster films and thinking, I want mm. that life. But looking mm. back, it is a life of fucking misery. Yeah, it is. It's a life of pain. It is, and... Obviously, even when I look at my mum and my sisters, I can see the pain of the life. Do you know Strain. what I mean? Strain. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. You know I mean, I can see it. And anything, any little thing happens, do you know what I mean? It's just like, it comes back to them a hundred mm -hmm. times. You know, like the feelings that they feel, any little thing. The emotion. Yeah. Yeah, you know that I mean? doesn't so, go away. The same as my mum, oh. she's lost brothers to murder and mm. stuff. And, the strains there. So mm. what do I do? Do I go and hide? Or do I mm. go, do I try and become something that I'm not? Mm. What I do is take the fucking reins. What I do mm. is make a life that we're all happy, mm. get a freedom, create a life exactly. that give me power and or my mum can go to your work and mm. people go, your son's doing amazing. Yeah, yeah. That shit there, you cannot buy. Yeah, yeah. No jewellery, no 100%. car, no holiday, nothing but that. Their self-worth that your son's mm. doing great after all the misery that he's mm. probably caused you and other family members mm. have caused you. Do you know what? Mm. I'm, I know what I've done wrong, mm. but here it is. I'm going yeah. to show you that fucking how much a yeah. amazing man I can be and mm. you always believed in it. That's powerful. Yeah, and I believe that for me, that's a bad man. For me, mm. somebody that can take the reins and quit addictions and quit mm. bullshitting himself, that's, mm. a, that's a fucking, that's a tough bastard. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because... There comes a stage in your 20s, maybe not your 20s, but maybe your 30s, when you start to realise, I'm in control, it's me, it's making these decisions yeah, yeah, yeah. to fuck up, to bring the strain to your sister's face, yeah. and your mum's face. Mm. But everybody's got to take responsibility as well. Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? I even say. your sister, even your yeah, mum, yeah. even my mum, even my, my sister, they've got to take some sort of responsibility. Yeah. A lot of people can point blame, mm. but there comes a time where you can actually take yourself out certain situations. Yeah. So going through all that and doing your 14 and kind of wanting peace. Mm. Because when you speak, man, you're, mm. you're a nice guy. You, mm. you don't, if somebody walked by, if you were mm. up, nobody would realise mm. the shit you actually went yeah, through. Shooting people news, he's involved in murders. But again, mm. appearance is fuck all because I know mm. people who are dangerous mm. that maybe get sitting in a pair of jeans on, sitting mm. in a pub having a pint that nobody would even mm. know of. It doesn't really mean no, fuck all. But it so like, we, the, like the guy I was telling you sitting down, with the glasses. Yeah, just chucky. Yeah, you do. Yeah. On another day, you just think, mm -hmm. who's that? Yeah. Don't How was your reputation difference. though? Because that was all over world news. That was all over the papers. That yeah, it was. People were shooting newsies at the police. Especially yeah. on news, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's one of the biggest guns out there. It was, you see people treat you different. Do you know what I mean? So, and like I said, it's not even. Did that stroke your ego though? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely at the time. Uh, definitely a time because remember, remember the place that you're in. At the, in the place that you're in now, we're in dispersal prison. There is no time for weakness. So if something like that is part of your aura that gets you through, 
you can't really knock it in that place. Do you know what I mean? Because no one don't want to hear anything about softy, softy. Everyone's just, if you're not tough, you're not hard, you'll be a victim in them places. It's that simple. Do you know what I mean? And, and like I said, I've been used to being that way because of prison and of being controlled. I know how it feels to be controlled, how to rebel against being controlled. So if I'm hearing something like that and people respect it and it helps me be more in control, because it comes back down to control, control of my environment because you've heard I've done something like that. At that time, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be saying, oh, I didn't do that, even though I'm not saying I did do it. Obviously, you already know I've done it. But I'm not going to be going around and trying to change your perception of me that I'm a nice guy. Like the guy that's nice and that, they don't respect him. He'll get robbed and get his canteen taken off him. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So Have, you were in Cat A? Yeah, I was in Cat A. I was, I was, I was, a, I was, a, I was a Cat A for, I was a Cat A for probably around seven years. Mm-hmm. So what, what happened to me was, what happened to me was, uh, um, when I went to prison the first time, I went to a place called, no, I remember I told you I went to Ellsbury, but I met this guy, Sinbad, and bearing in mind, yeah, I have been abandoned, you know, when I was younger, yeah? So, you know, if you're abandoned when you're younger, you're always looking for something to connect to, innit? Something to be a part of, yeah? So, he used to get, people used to bully him, yeah? And I've really never, ever liked bullies and that. Do you know what I mean? I've always standed up for the people because I can. Do you know what I mean? So what it was is, so I started to hang around with him so people didn't, didn't bother him. But when he done that, when I was doing that, he started to introduce me to something called Islam. Yeah? So he's doing that now. So obviously for them, them few years to... I was uh, say around 17. So I was like one of the first people, black boys in the prison system to become Muslim, yeah? Cause when I was when I when I became it, no one else wasn't. Yeah, no one else wasn't Muslim. It wasn't it wasn't cool to be Muslim. What was people saying to you doing that? What are you doing that for, man? It's just it's not, a weird door and Yeah, stuff, it's not man. even not even your religion. You just I don't know why you're following the Asian man for da 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 da. And I'm and then obviously because I'm hard-headed, I started to be, because obviously when you go to the mosque in that, and remember, there, there are things about loving that, you know, like proper Muslims, not mm. these other, there's, 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 through, through prison, I've, I've found out there's been two types of people. There's people that are really Muslims and there's people that came to be Muslims. Yeah, and there's people that are Muslims, but obviously they struggle with certain things. So there's Drink, three types. Maybe they're still drinking, smoking, yeah, 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 stuff like that. yeah, yeah. So, so, but, 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 but they're still they still pray five times a day. They still they still try, and at the end of the day, that's the most you can do, isn't it? Especially if you, like you said, you know what's wrong or right. Yeah, you can only try, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, as human, yeah, they make mistakes, make mistakes yeah. all the time. Yeah. So, because of when I'm going to the mosque and it's all love, at this, like. And the wrong people are not involved in Islam at this stage in prison, yeah? It's just, if you are really a Muslim, do you know what I mean? You know, like your family and stuff like that, you, you've been born into, because it's more probably just Asian people in the mosque, yeah? But when I come there and, you know, the amount of love they're showing you in that, yeah? That makes you feel love for one. Is that the first you'd ever felt that? Properly? Yeah, really, do you know what I mean? Because even the friends I grew up with, the guys on the street, like, they didn't love me. Do you know what I mean? They didn't love yeah, me at all. Yeah, they used you. Yeah, they didn't love me mm. at all. Like, I see it with all the work. You know what I mean? Like, the man that I grew up in Brixton and they call we gang and all that. Like, they weren't my friends. Do you know what I mean? And that's why now I have no problem with not even having dealing with them. Like, I don't have no problem about it at all because I done 10, 10, nearly 15, no, around 15 years in prison. No visits. No visits. So yeah. I don't really care. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's not a problem for me. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? But like I said, when, when I was going to the mosque, the amount of the love felt genuine. Mm. And it was. I know it was. Do you know what I mean? But now, because of that now, because now I feel like, yeah, that's my family, I have now become a protector of our setup. 
you get what I'm saying? Because now this is this is my thing, innit? So I was serious about what I was involved in, yeah? Like there weren't no there weren't no um extreme stuff, extremist stuff or nothing like that. I'm just about these are my brothers and Getting love. Yeah, yeah. love. Did you have to forgive your past? For, did you have to ask for forgiveness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to do all of that. Because mm-hmm. yeah. you're very calm know, now. Yeah, and know that you've been forgiven as yeah. well. Do you know what I mean? Were you, what was your state when you were younger? Were you, I wasn't calm then. Were you not? I was hype. I was, yeah. I was very Hyper. hyped. Yeah, I was very yeah. hyped, yeah. So, obviously, through that sentence, yeah, I was in, um, in the fold of Islam. And then when I came back out, I never had Islam in my head. Do you know what I mean? I just came back out, started smoking, started drinking. And in my and within my community, that at that time, like I said, it wasn't cool to join Islam or anything like that. So Islam wasn't even a big thing in my community. So it's not like nowadays, you come out of prison, you can go into the community full of Muslim brothers and people who still want to help you and blah, blah. There weren't none of that. Do you know what I mean? So I just came out and just went straight back to what I know, the drugs, the road, girls, etc. So I done that, went went back to prison, came back out. In prison, I was still Muslim. And when I came out, I wasn't I, I never done anything to do with Muslim. And then I got arrested for the 14 years. Yeah, the 14 that we talk mm-hmm. we're not at the stage where yeah, we're yeah. at now. So now when we're at that stage now, it seems like a new wave has happened and there's now there's lots of people who are becoming Muslims. Yeah. And that's good. But I realise it's only good as long as the people have got the right intentions, you know, who are joining. Yeah. So, cause, and what, 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 what I started to see through the time I was in prison is like... A lot of people saying they're doing it for food as well. Yeah. yeah they're, they're doing it for protection. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Family. So yeah, so we got, we got, people who are rapists now coming to prison saying, oh, I'm Muslim and now everyone has to leave him alone. Do you know what I'm saying? And that guy who's saying that he's a snitch, but now man has to leave him alone. Do you get what I'm saying? So I could see I was around a lot of people who were using Islam for their own benefits, own benefit, like as a crutch, you know, like to yeah. get through prison. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, obviously, like I said, when I came out of prison, my mind was never on Islam. But when I was in prison, it seemed like I was, but at them two, at those two times when I was in prison, I didn't need no one to protect me. Mm-hmm. I was in control wherever I was. You were doing it for change? Yeah, yeah, not, not, yeah, I was doing it because I felt like, yeah, this felt good. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It mm-hmm. made me feel good when I was praying. It gave me, it gave me some kind Strength. of- Strength. Yeah, it gave me something that I didn't have before. Yeah, so it wasn't nothing to do protect because I didn't need protecting. So when I got to that stage now, I was in there. I was still going to mosque and that, but then I started realising, you see on my um, KA reports, they kept on saying, oh, yeah, part of the Muslim boys. Is part that of like the Muslim gang? Boys. Yeah, like part of the gang. And I've never ever saw myself as no... Because like I said, I came into the religion with the right intentions. So I never ever saw myself as no Muslim gang. I don't know what, you know, like you lot are watching from your security mind standpoint mm-hmm. and making notes, but maybe them guys who you're talking about over there, maybe they are Muslim, the Muslim boy yeah. gang, but because I talk to them, doesn't mean- Your association. I'm, the, I'm, yeah. I'm Muslim gang. The, but no matter yeah, what- Yeah, because I've never needed to have a gang except for when I was growing yeah. up. But no matter what in prison, if you're shooting at news at coppers, if you've been in the system since you're no, 12, they ain't up. gonna see you. They're adding it up, yeah. so they're adding it up. So that's what, you just mm-hmm. got to where I was going. So, so even though I'm looking at it like that, they're looking at everything. Mm-hmm. Like you said, from 12. Fighting the screws. Fighting the screws, anti-authority. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Now, Muslim, and now how we're looking at Muslims in prison, because we know that in prison, they're getting, um, what's it called? Radicalized. And maybe, yeah, you got the potential to be an extremist, an extremist yeah, yeah. or maybe make it even big in that mm-hmm. gang and stuff like that. That's how they're looking at it. Do you know what I mean? So, which is understandable no, as well. Which is understandable. Mm-hmm. Is, is definitely understandable. Now, and, and I get it now. But when I'm suffering it, I'm just pissed off. Making you anti authority again. Exactly. <laughs> exactly yeah. So now, but 
So anyway, I was uh, that was happening, yeah, that was happening, and I was just thinking, you know, I was thinking, yeah, I want parole, but I don't think they can give it to me because I'm looking at my the reports that they're writing for me, and I'm thinking, no parole man person in their mind's gonna give me parole. But anyway, that went past, and everything was fine, and then the seven seven, you know, the bombing. Yeah, that happened, didn't it? Yeah. And I don't know why, yeah, but it's just like, to me, I felt like, you know, when I watched all the stuff on the news and that, I felt like whoever done that threat on my family, do you understand? Because I'm thinking my mum could be on the bus, my sisters, Yeah, that's your daughter. Home, sorry, yeah. yeah, 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 because you know some, like, I know people have a lot of things to say about my views and how I see things, yeah, but you know what, yeah? I like to deal with the reality and facts. So people like to say, oh yeah, but you're from here and you're from there. Most of the, what you're talking about, yeah? Like you, you, like you, you can know you're from Scotland, you've got a Scottish accent, mm -hmm. yeah? Where they wanna say I'm from, I don't have them accents. Do you get me? Mm -hmm. I know that I'm born here, do you know what I mean? And when I look at all the madness that I've done and I've still allowed to be sitting here now talking to you, yeah? I feel like that's great. Do you get what I'm saying? I feel yeah. like that's great. So there's no need for me to be mad with where I come from. I only can get mad of where I come from when if I start believing that person's story that I'm really from over there or I'm really from over there. I don't feel like I need to be angry. Do you get what I'm saying? Because I feel like the place I was born has allowed me to do so much mistakes and still turn my life around. Yeah? Not everyone can think like that. But because I think like that, I can appreciate where I'm from and what it's done for me. Like, I've, 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 like all these things I've learned in the next country, I might not be able to learn. I might have just gone through it and either died, got an electric chair or something mm -hmm. messed up. But I've been allowed because the way the country's set up to be able to still prosper after all of that. Yeah. And I think that's great, isn't it? Of course it is. Exactly. You're learning from your mistakes. Exactly. I don't care. I'm not a religious man. I believe in higher power, but yeah. there's people on the show who turn to Christ, yeah. turn to Islam, and they're doing great. See if yeah. you're not hurting anyone, yeah. I'm not forcing your views on anyone. Exactly. Do what you want. Exactly. If it's helping you become a better person, exactly. if it's keeping you out of prison, if it's exactly. stopping you taking crack or alcohol, exactly. then do it. So I've tried to I've tried to understand who I am. Yeah. Not who someone wants me to think I am. Did you ever do therapy? I yeah, I done therapy. In prison? I done therapy in prison and when I first got out. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Oh, that I used to, I used to suffer from stomach aches. That's when I used to, holding on to all your yeah, grief Yeah, when I used to go to pain. the doctors, they couldn't find nothing wrong with me. Mm -hmm. and after three counselling sessions, I just felt it just leave my body. The trauma, the pain, yeah, the misery. When I was young, I, I never used to talk. Mm -hmm. I used to just act. If someone said something, you know, there's no talking about it. It's just acting. Mm -hmm. And I just keep it all bottled up. But that's because obviously your parents teach you, innit? You do a lot of Don't talk. A lot of crying at therapy. Is that only tears? No, 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 no. The, the, the crying at therapy only happened when I got out. When I was doing it inside, tears never came to me. Do you know what I mean? It's when I came out. You know, because it was just like, I've come out of it. And you know, like when you're in there, you, even though I'm doing therapy, I still got the mask on. Of course. Because you're yeah, in there. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, when, yeah. when I came out of here, they banned me for London for two years and I stayed in Manchester. Why? Because of the gun thing? The Uzi? Because of, no, because before I come out, they had Osman warnings on my life. Like I was in a DCAT and I was working in a place called the Galleries of Justice. And um, when I was working in there, it's a museum in Nottingham. They said that there were threats on my life. Yeah. But I don't believe them because, because I was about to get parole. And because I'm in a DCAT already, I believe if I would have got my parole, when I come out, there will be no restrictions on me because I've already proved myself within the community. Do you get what I'm saying? So what they done is, they said there's been threats to my life and they took me out of the DCAT and put me back in the CCAT, yeah? And then when my parole came up, they still said, obviously, he's in CCAT, ain't it? So he ain't been proven in the community. So mm -hmm. my parole got knocked back. And if you give it an Osman warning, they're supposed to come and tell you you know, X, yeah, Y, Z. Got to sign it as well. Up to now, I ain't signed nothing and yeah. they ain't spoke to me. They just told the prison that and the prison moved me out of the prison and put me back. So, I don't even believe just an there excuse was any to take it back. Yeah, just an excuse to take yeah. it back because I was about to go to university as well. And do what? Um, 
to- something and tourism. What goes mm. with tourism? Travel. Travel and tourism. Like mm-hmm. the, the person that I used to work for in the National Guard Justice, he was like the head on the board of the Nottingham thingy when he got me a place in mm-hmm. there. And then it was like two weeks until I start college. So if I would have had that and I'm in a decat and I'm going to university, I'm getting parole. Yeah, because you're then, doing good. And then, and yeah, and then you can't, you can't tell me about, oh, I need to do this and do that mm-hmm. because I've already proved it already that mm-hmm. I'm all right, that's how I'm in a decat. Yeah. And they didn't want that, so. So the last nine years you're out, free man, living yeah. life, you've worked on yourself mentally. Yeah. How have you been the last nine years adapting to society again? Well, like I said, the first two years was hard, but it was the best thing because like you said before, when you go into certain situations and there's no expectation of you, as in the reputation or anything, you can actually grow. And I found when I was in Manchester, I kind of grew because all the thoughts that I had inside myself in prison, when I came out, I was allowed to get stronger in my thoughts that I could achieve them. Like every time I've been in prison before, you could have good intentions and good thoughts in your brain, but when you come back out and go straight back into that pot, they all get wiped out of your brain. Mm -hmm. You kind of go with what is going on now. And when I came to Manchester, all the scripts and all the books and all the literature and the songs I wrote, when I'm up there and I got no, no one to really see, even though my family was there, but there was another the side of Manchester where I was. I was in Newton Heath. They, um, you go back into that side and start, you know, going in your books and reading things and you start making phone calls and telling people your ideas and then there's a meeting and and then it's like, yeah, that stuff that you believed in at the time, you can really make it happen and you can start seeing results where if I would have went straight to London, I wouldn't have went in my bags. All I would have done is probably link someone and kind of got caught up in what they were doing because it would have seemed like what they're doing is more important because right now nothing ain't going on for me. Do you know what I mean? So where I sat down with my work and then obviously the probation was helping me, I was telling her things that I wrote and that, and then they're telling me to go over there, telling me to go and meet that person. And then, um, one time I even went to um, the university down Manchester and just told them about my life. Uh, once I done that, they paid me for it, yeah? And they said, yeah, they want to see me again. So I done a few of them. And then after that, they said that probation officers want to hear my story. So I went to a new probation officer, not before they joined probation, told them my story. I see a couple of them crying and stuff like that. And then they sent me to some place in Manchester where the gun police are to give them my story. And you see when I went in there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you see when I went in there, yeah? Were you nervous? Bro, I've never been so scared in yeah. my life. Like I was sitting down in this hall, you know, like it was like a court already, mm-hmm. you know the way the court halls are? Yeah. And they said, yeah, I was just, they said, yeah, just sit there. And the probation officer, just sit there. I was sitting there and I was thinking, rah. And they brought me through this door. Bruv, Forget mean mugs in the in the in the in the in the ghetto, mm-hmm. bro. You see when these guys are looking at me, yo, bro. I you could thinking, feel it. I could feel it. Yeah, because you know they take it personal mm-hmm. when you've of done something like that. Of course, it's a like family, that. isn't it? Yeah, exactly. They take it serious. So mm-hmm. when I walked in there, I was like, R-, like this is the most nervous I've ever. Cause remember before when I'm giving the university, I was thinking, yeah, man, this is I can Easy. do this. Yeah, this yeah. is it's my life, isn't it? I just spin it off. Yeah. You get me? <clears throat> then when I went in that room and it was a small room as well, you know. It's right, no bigger than this. Mm-hmm. And there was just like three chairs, three chairs, three chairs, three chairs. Some of them even want to sit down. Some of them were just arms folded yeah, at the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They were just looking at me, mm-hmm. and then obviously I just started. And bruv, you know when I finished? They all went <laughs> and they shook my hand, yeah. And that day I cried. Mm-hmm. That day I cried, not in front of them. Like I sat down in the finger room and thought, wow, imagine that. Yeah, I'm doing something with my life. Yeah, and that's the power. That. Of, that's the power of imagine that life and couldn't believe it. Making huh? changes and making progress and learning mm. from your mistakes mm. and I say it all the time. But I've never told no one that yeah, by the way. You know that. But you can that learn, mate. That. That's powerful though. Mm. To being the bad man, mm. shooting oozies, mm. drugs, losing family members mm. and friends to murder, mm. suicide, mm. overdose, mm. all the usual suspects mm. in that life. To then speaking in front of mm. the screws and getting a round no, of applause. No, arm police. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? 
Yeah, was it, what are they called again? I forgot what they called. Arm just bonds. Yeah, no, they had a name. Excalibur. Mm -hmm. That's what they call that Manchester yeah. Excalibur. But they can learn from you as well. No, hundred percent, you know hundred I mean? percent. And we grew up in an environment. I was grew up to fucking hate the police, yeah. hate them. Snitches get put in ditches. Mm. Mentality, hate them. And again, who's the first people if your someone goes mm. missing or mm. your your kids or the house gets mm. broken into police you they are doing their job do you know mm. what I mean and if you're in a life of crime you fucking hate them because yeah. they can put you away exactly. and rightly so yeah. yeah like I think out of everything I've done that was the most bravest thing I've ever done in my life mm -hmm. did that kick you on it took it took, it took it took them it took after that they started bringing me to the um, town hall and that to um, help with um, you know with youth preventions and Obviously, I was doing that, and then obviously I just moved back to London because I realised that what I needed to do, I can't really do up here. How did you get accepted coming back to London? Was your life still in danger? Or trying to change your life like, was difficult as well, like, isn't it? Because your conscience yeah. kicks into play all the bad shit yeah, that you've done. Yeah, forget about what could be. Mm -hmm. It's that stuff you're talking about. Yeah. That's what holds you back. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? But in my community... I've never grown up fearful because of my stepdad. You know, like in that surrounding. Mm -hmm. Like I could go somewhere else and be fearful. Do you know what I mean? And get the adrenaline rush. But in that area there, I've never ever felt like I've needed to be scared. You know, because I've obviously had the protection from him and then obviously the protection of who people think I am. Has anybody ever tried to take him out before? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. of course, of course, but... This is a scary thing, if we've yeah. got the baddest man on the street or yeah. the city, yeah. you do bad shit because you think you're always untouchable, but as soon as mm. the, the head of the yeah, snake yeah, gets yeah, cut, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. always comes top always, for you. Always, and always, And I've seen that happen many yeah, times. Yeah, definitely. So, um, when I came back, and then obviously, you know when... I come back, and obviously I'm just walking the streets, innit, at this time, innit, like, not, I haven't got a driving licence, do you know what I mean? So I'm just walking... Walking, walking, and obviously every car that goes past. Do you know what I mean? And then when you're seeing people, they're saying, um, what's that little saying that used to get me paranoid all the time? Yeah, be safe, bro, be safe. <laughs> what the fuck do you know? Yeah, you get yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, be safe, bro, be safe. Mm -hmm. I think, what, do you, what do you mean by I started asking them, what do they mean by that? No, no, I'm just saying, bro, just be safe. But you remember, like you said, because of the things that's gone on in my mm -hmm. mind, I don't know, I'm yeah. thinking, yeah, so... Around the first, the first, the first probably two, three years, like even if you watch some of my interviews when I first come out, the guy's hitting me on the road and I'm going like that. Mm -hmm. You know, every car that passes, I'm like that. <laughs> and it's not, it's not like I'm, it's natural. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm just looking like that. You can just see me like, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 I'm interview yeah, yeah, answering the questions, but just looking around because what I've been led to believe, even though like I didn't get the husband warning, and obviously a couple of my friends have died. Should I be out here? But I'm thinking to myself, I'm not gonna go and hide in Manchester and not become all I can be. Because I knew I had plans. And then as soon as I started to apply myself, I saw things changing. And that just gave me more confidence. And then the more I started to change people's perception of me, the more my life started to feel better and start to get easier. Where before, People were wary of even standing next to me. I don't believe you either, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I you're know, changing, I know, I know. You, when you're going through a change, mm. you feel as if you're trying to mm. tell everybody that you've changed. Mm. I've changed, but then mm. there comes a point you go, you know mm. what? Fuck everybody else. Mm -mm. Actions speak louder than words. Mm. This is what I'm doing. Mm. We don't know what's round the corner, brother. Mm. We don't mm. know what's. No round. one does. We don't know. Mm. It's about. Do you know what? I'm not going to live in fear. Mm. Mm. And you tend to see. That's when you become a tough man, mm. is when mm. you, you, your Most fear definitely. goes. Not when you're Most holding definitely. a gun or shooting a news yeah, out a window yeah, and not looking, yeah, yeah. taking a shot. That's shit. when you are scared, yeah. actually, yeah. when you're shooting. Yeah, when that's when yeah, you're that's most when vulnerable. You are scared. Yeah, yeah. And people think that's when you're at yeah, your yeah, yeah. But the yeah. toughest one is yeah. the one who can learn from the mistakes, yeah, who can understand, I don't need this life, mm. that sicky feeling you've had in your belly mm. for 30 odd years. I and then it goes because you're not holding on to that anxiety, that pain, that you're not good enough anymore. Mm, mm. Everybody's got goodness in them, mm, greatness mm. in them. 100%. Do you know what I mean? So plans for the future, my brother? Well, like I said, basically when I came out, I had all these dreams and that. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is, I've, I started to make music, but I felt like, I had my, I had like, you know, people I know from the community, you know, like in music videos and that of me. And I just thought to myself, 
because I know my community well. I know some of these people have got more to offer than just standing up in music videos, innit? You know, because I know their characters and that. It doesn't matter if they got money or they're broke. They got this, you know, like star quality about them. So I said to myself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit back, do some writing, and um, uh, I designed the drama series. And none of these... None of these people in the drama series are actors. Old or talent? They're, yeah, they're all just people that I know you. I remember when you was young, you used to be funny or you used to be, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? You got away with words or, and I just put them all in the drama series and they wanted to keep their names. Yeah, you know, so for their little Instagram and their socials. Oh, yeah. yeah, so we done all of that, kept their names and I kept the, the script loose because I didn't want to say, say this and just say it the way I want you to say it. I want you to put your personality on it. So I kept it. I, I'll give you the guidelines. I'm, I'm trying to get from A to B to C, but I need you to say this, but just say it in the way you want to say it or say it in your style or put your personality on it. And then we're on, we just finished the third season and I'm fin- filming, finishing the fourth season right now. Yeah. Yeah. Where can people it's, watch this? On Sky, Channel 186. That's brilliant, Younger man. TV, yeah, they just they just pull it on. So the fifth episode in from mm-hmm. the first series. It's on Younger TV. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know what Younger TV is, you can just go to, um, I've got, I got a page called Real Life TV UK. Mm-hmm. The link's in the bio. So you can just go straight through either to the YouTube or you can just watch it on Sky. What in, about your own social media for people who want to get yeah, in contact? Mine, yeah, mine's official underscore... Quincy underscore Thwaites. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, 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 I control both of those. I follow the Rule Life TV UK and Quincy Paxman. And if, I mean, not Quincy Paxman, that's what I used to be called. Is that? <laughs> yeah, when I was doing interviews. Is that? Get aliases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Quincy underscore, no, official underscore Quincy underscore Thwaites. Yeah, that's a slap my name. What about Twitter or Instagram? Have you got any of that stuff? Um, that is Instagram. Yeah, so that's Instagram. Yeah, that's as Instagram, well. yeah. Twitter is. Um, it's Cosmo Medici, but that is um, I don't want to confuse anyone with all the names. Mm-hmm. Just go to Quincy, uh, official underscore Quincy for it's on Instagram mm-hmm. and everything's and there. Everything's there. Got to touch on my man Yami because yeah. it was Yami that set up yeah, this that's, interview. That's uncle, that's yeah, big uncle there. Absolutely love Yami. Yami's yeah. done over 40 years in the jail, came out, changed his life, yeah. and you wouldn't even think it. We yeah. speak. Near enough every day, yeah. me and Yami love him to bits. Yeah. We're actually going to make a documentary yeah. and he's getting involved. I just think. Yeah, he told me. His he's story, looking forward to yeah, it. Yeah, his story's yeah, he's amazing, phenomenal, man. He's just a yeah. great big bu- bubbly person mm-hmm. that lights up a fucking room and, you, and then you understand his own story and his own struggles when he went through as a kid yeah. to still keep fighting. Yeah. It's good that people can, we're getting the platform now that people can get the story mm. and understand, wait a minute. He mm. was shooting a gun. Why Why would somebody want to speak to him? But then you understand, wait a minute, well, you were abandoned at 12. You mm. were in homes. You were sleeping homeless. You needed mm. to find other people to accept you. So you'd done mm. bad things because what accepts us into a gang. Mm. And now look what you're doing now is phenomenal, brother. So I'm going to mm. shake your hand for that, man. I think Thanks. what you're doing is unbelievable mm. from the character that you are to the man that you are mm. now is, is total night and day. And yeah. It's beautiful. For anybody that's watching, and thinks they want to be a bad man. Mm. They think it's a life. Maybe mm. their dad's a bad man or their uncle's. Mm. And they think, okay, I want to be that. Because they see the girls just now. They see a bit of money. Mm. Maybe see the Jeeps or the convertibles, the Rolexes. Mm. But we both know it doesn't mean fuck all. Mean Eventually gets took off them in mm. time. And for anybody watching, what advice would you give for them? The, the, the government or the kids? Kids. The kids. Like... You see, if you have a dream, yeah, and, you know, it might, it might be a group of you who've got a dream. You see, if your friends don't want to support you in your dream, I feel like you should find new friends because, you see, for someone to have a dream, it's not easy in the, in the, in the communities we live in. You some, sometimes you can seem like you're weird you know, by having a dream and that. But you see, if you don't be strong and go for your dream, the way everything's set up right now, you could just end up being a victim. And that's a victim of prison, victim of death or mental health. Do you know what I mean? Because like I said, my, my dad's got mental health now. So if you've got a dream, because I don't want to say, you know, what's, 
what's wrong and right or don't do this, don't do that. I just say, if you've got a dream and your friends ain't supporting you, if you have to be by yourself to fulfill the dream, do it because it'll be worth it at the end of the day. The other side is not worth it. So if you've got a dream, just focus on it. Find a way to be strong to fulfill it and don't follow friends. Yeah, if you've got a dream, you've got to protect it, man. Yeah, man, it's I mean? everything. Yeah. How's your relationship? You still go and see your dad? Um, yeah, he's in prison at the yeah, moment. Yeah, he says that. Yeah, How yeah, long has yeah. he been in for now? Um, a few years. Yeah, so. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think what you're doing, brother, is unbelievable. Mm. And going forward for the future, I can't wait to see what you do. But yeah. Quincy, it's nice been an one. absolute pleasure, brother. Nice God bless. Thank see. you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.